um, called to order the Monday, October 18th um, meeting of the select board. First motion is approve the agenda unless there are any changes. I would like, I think that banner policy line, I'm assuming this is going to be a continued discussion of the banner conversation of last week as well. I think there's participants here. You can move it up if you want. Um, if we do move it up, I want to put it behind the interview, so okay. just because last week it went on. Um, so, any other? If we'll move D to B. Discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Consent agenda items. Minutes from October 4th meeting. I move to approve the consent agenda items. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, next, we move on to the public portion. I really don't like how this setup is. Um, sorry, we're taking away from you. Um, this is an opportunity for the public to speak. As many of you might be here to discuss an agenda item, we will give you the opportunity. We're going to try to limit discussion to two minutes a person, give everyone a chance to talk. Um, but it, it, this is a select board meeting. We're here to do the business of the select board. So. Um, we hope to give everyone a chance that is participating tonight to speak, but just know that we do have other agenda items we need to get through. Um, if you have anything to discuss that's not on the agenda, this is your opportunity for public comment. And please understand that we'll also try to give you an opportunity to speak on the specific agenda items. Um, is there anyone here to speak on non-agenda items? Okay. We will move on to the update from CV Fiber Representatives. the chair of CB Fiber. And I'm Linda Gravel. I'm the uh, water ferry delegate. I know you, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have the square in the upper right-hand corner? I know. I'm just going to be able to admit people at the same oh, time. Oh, I see. So I, I see. might be doing a little screen over here for a little bit. I got gotcha. you. Wonderful. So, um, like I said, I'm, I'm Jeremy Hansen, um, the chair of CB Fiber. I just wanted to kind of go through a bit of a presentation um, to explain where we are, um, what our plans are, um, take any questions that you might have, um, and just um, if anybody's interested in what we're doing. Um, I also have an update as of today. I, Linda hasn't even heard this yet, but uh, so towards the end, I will somebody remind me about the new the news, and I will share that. <laughs> okay, so we go down to the next slide. So CB Fiber is a municipality. Um, it's something called the Communications Union District. We were formed in 2018 by a vote of about uh, 12 member municipalities in central Vermont. Um, Waterbury at the time elected to not um, put that on the town meeting ballot that year. Um, we are now with Waterbury at 21 member communities. Um, you can find the enabling statute 30 BSA chapter 82 if, in case you need uh, help sleeping. Um, we are we're the second of the CUDs uh, in Vermont after EC Fiber, and now there are an additional seven after us, most of which were formed last year. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so 
our, our goal is fast, dependable, and affordable internet, universal coverage in our member towns. Um, but our first priority, the first thing that we're going to attend to is to get to folks who are underserved. And without getting into all, without getting into the details there, that's really people who only have DSL. Um, thankfully, uh, Waterbury is pretty well covered by cable. More than 90% have the availability of cable. And we have a map coming up in a little bit that kind of shows you where those folks are that don't have, uh, that don't have cable, that only have DSL available. And I should say too that I am fully caffeinated. I'm gonna go to 150% speed, so if you have questions, just stop me. Um, <laughs> I've given this presentation probably 10 times, so I'm just going to blast through it, so stop me if you need to. Um, so we're shooting for roughly 50% of underserved folks by 2022. That could slip a little bit, um, but we really we have a, a priority area for next year identified, and we have our priority areas for future years identified as well. Next slide, please. And there's the map of where we are currently. Each of these towns gets a delegate, like the wonderful Linda here, um, and that makes up the governing board. And so the Waterbury Select Board has five people. Um, I, as the chair, I get to wrangle 21 delegates and alternates and contractors and stuff. So that's, that's fun. Um, but we all are pushing the same direction. We're all pushing for the same thing, and that's better internet service everywhere in central Vermont. Next slide. So um, when all is said and done, we're looking at about 1,200 miles of fiber along utility poles primarily and some, um, some underground as well where we need to go. I understand in Waterbury Center, for example, um, you know, a project recently that involved putting a lot of utilities and such under the streets. Um, if only we had been here a couple years earlier and we could have gotten some space in that, that would have made things um, even easier, but e even so, we will deal with that when, when we get there. Pause. Can anybody hear anything online? I see red down where the like no, no, microphone. Should I go try to push that button? I don't Hang know. tight. How about now? Wonderful. So I can start over again if you like, or I can just keep on technology. Keep on plowing for it. All right. All right. So um, when all is said and done, we have about uh, 1,200 miles, 1,200 road miles. So if you look at the AOT maps that you recertify every year, I was on the Berlin Select Board, so I remember that that exercise. Um, we add them all together of where we're likely to build about 1,200 miles. Um, that's going to reach about 26,000 homes and businesses in central Vermont. Um, and the total cost is about $46 million. So, yeah, next slide. <coughs> so, formed in 2018. Um, we already had uh, feasibility and business studies kind of on their way, um, being worked on before COVID hit. So we were already pretty well positioned and ready to go um, before the pandemic really illustrated why everybody actually needed real internet service and not, um, and not what a lot of people have, which is none or poor or you know, required them to, if more than one person used it at a time for people to take turns, you know, rationing and such. So there's a lot of details. I'm happy to go into, into some of the things that we're doing this year. Um, one of the main things that we're doing right now is we have contractors out in our, our first, uh, the first area that we're looking at building in, and they're doing pole inventories. So taking pictures of each pole, measuring the, the stuff that's attached to it, specific uh, GPS coordinates, so that we can go to our next step, which is looking at exactly what we are going to, um, the equipment we're gonna purchase, the fiber we're gonna purchase, and, and to make sure that the poles that we're looking at can actually support what's there. Uh, support what we're going to put onto them, I should say. Um, we also have a high-level design underway, uh, which essentially gets us gets us a better idea of how the network might look uh, at the end. Next slide, please. Got a quick question. Sure. So, if the poles aren't uh, sized right, whose whose coin is that? Five thousand dollars a piece. That is on us. 
you know, we have a partnership with um, with WEC, Washington Electric Co-op. Um, so they kind of know that that stuff's coming. So they have a whole bunch of poles sitting there ready to go. Um, if they are uh, old poles that are um, essentially just decrepit and they need to be replaced anyways, WEC will be replacing those. If it's a matter of the pole's not tall enough because there's just so much other stuff on there that we, we need to replace it to get our stuff on there, that's on us then. But we're, yeah, we're budgeting you know, $5,000 a pole and expecting to replace about a pole a mile. Mm -hmm. So if you could just follow up on that, um, your municipality, and you've got 21 member communities, including Wadley. What's your funding source right now? Where do you get your money? Well, I, you, you make me cut to the end to the, to the special news, but um, so a, a couple of slides later, we actually have a breakdown. Well, if of, you're going to get there, you can wait. So, so, so I mean, re realistically, right now, grant funding, but because we're a municipality, um, the, the original aim was to look at revenue bonds. So, Towns don't usually have revenues. If you're going to bond for a new fire station or something like that, it's going to be a bond based on the good faith and credit and taxing capability of the town. We don't have that. We are firewalled off from taking any tax money from towns at all. So even if you wanted to write us a big check, which would be nice, it would not be legal. Um, so it was really going to be revenue bonds. But because we're a municipality, we can do that fairly cheaply. Um, but there is a lot. There is a lot of grant money coming down the pike right now. And so we, again, even before COVID, we've worked with the legislature about how can we make this work better. So federal, state, grant money. Um, and the, the, the punchline is uh, $2.8 million, they said yes this morning. So um, very excited to get that get that going. And that's for um, that's our pre-construction for our areas. Uh, I won't get into the details, but um, essentially gets us through some of the pre-construction stuff for the next 18 months. Thank you. Yes, indeed. That was great. Um, so this is our basic process. Um, so we're doing the poll inventory right now. So that's getting a sense of what's out there. And these are Washington Electric Co-op polls. There's um, Green Mountain Power polls. Consolidated has some polls. Um, you know, up in the northern parts of the territory, there's some hardwick. Um, Morrisville. So we are looking at using all of them. So prime, you know, we're looking at putting fiber on the existing utility poles that are there. We're not looking really at you know securing other rights of way or any, anything else um, fancy like that. Once we have the full inventory done, we can go and do our network design, which gives us a sense of where are the fibers actually running. How are we sort of doing our you think about it as like a highway system, where are we putting our, the bigger paved highways, where are we putting the smaller dirt roads, class one, class two, class three roads. We have a very analogous setup with network design. Um, once we do that, we will actually do a more detailed design, which will get us down to the bill of goods, like the specific, we're buying this many miles of fiber, we need this many devices, we need this many you know, um, power plugs to connect all these things together. So it's two phases of network design. The make ready is then the process of going to each and every pole and moving everybody that's on that pole below the power, moving them down a little bit. So everybody gets to get moved, moved down. So it's always that phone line, the copper wire that's down at the bottom, because they're the oldest ones. And so then we just go in and put our fiber in over the top in the next, in the next stop in construction. Once that's there, then we um, essentially can pull individual strands of fiber to individual houses or businesses or you know, town offices for that matter. And that's the service part. Next slide. So overall cost for the network looks to be about 46 million. Um, Waterbury, if we just look, so this is sort of a back of the napkin thing. This is based on 72 road miles. Whether we would actually build that much or whether it would actually cost this, um, I can't say that definitively, but this is us doing kind of um, the, the best back, back of the napkin calculation that we can right now. So the overall cost of building all of Waterbury would be about $3 million as of the, you know, with the costs right now. Okay, next slide. So like I said, our first priority is the uh, underserved folks, and we're going to look at doing about 300 miles of fiber next year. We can get everything lined up. All of, all of our funding falls into place, which 
Um, Vermont created a new entity called the Vermont Community Broadband Board, and it was them that met this morning and authorized those federal funds to be um, allocated to us to do our pre-construction. And so we're hoping to build um, 300 miles for the next two years to get the underserved folks. Um, and then after that, I, that gets to about 90, 95% I think of underserved folks in all of our 21 communities. Um, and then we will essentially start building into the denser places after that. But <clears throat> we still have to be able to pay our bills. So, you know, folks are going to be paying whatever the monthly cost happens to be. We haven't sorted that out yet. But um, at that point, we should be stable enough revenue-wise that we can pay our bills and we can still have some software way and we can continue to build um, you know, towards the eventual goal of universal service. Next slide, please. Yep, this is this was not the one. Um, I can tell you, I'm just going to do this from memory. Um, I don't think there were any. Um, there, there may be a couple of premises that have um, fiber service, and that would be down in Waterbury Center. That would be businesses who have paid explicitly for that. Um, otherwise, I think it's something like 90 to 95 percent have at least cable, and then there's five-ish percent that have less than that, and that would be our, our target for step first. So a minute ago when you showed Waterbury with 72 miles of road, uh, so that you must that must include private roads because we only have about 48 miles of town highway. So 72 miles of road is about twice as much as we have. So, so it, it, it could very well be. It was it, our, probably our map guy just went and pulled whatever the the GIS map total so class one through class four. Um, so yeah, so it's likely to be a lot smaller than that. I, well, like I, I said, if it, it's measuring roads that are not owned by the public, you know, there's power poles that go up private roads, but okay, there's so no, it's not a town highway is what I'm saying. Okay, so, so, he, so he may then have been measuring the actual distance along the poles, along the rights of way that yeah. don't follow. Okay, roads. good, that, thank that, you. That's actually a good point. Um, so next slide then. And th there's a map coming up, and that might illustrate this a bit, a bit better. Um, so area A, five communities. Um, that lets us well, pass 1,600 underserved addresses. This gives us roughly 150 miles. Um, this is the first area that we're focusing on. This is the only area that we've actually announced where it is, and it's um, Moortown, Middlesex, Worcester, Callis, and what am I missing? Part of East Montreal, I think. And then so area B, area C, these will be the other areas that have large, large numbers of underserved folks. So if you can imagine us sort of kind of drawing a circle around Montpelier, Barry, Barrytown, Berlin, um, those are the places that have the highest percentage of folks that need the service the most. Um, that's, you know, we will eventually get to, to Waterbury, to Barry City, to Barrytown, to Berlin, to Montpelier, but because those places are pretty well served, they don't come in until this phase two, until we get done with the underserved. So, um, unfortunately, um, my town in Berlin is towards the end of the list. Next slide. So here's our rough, if you like, um, if you're if any project managers around, this you know, gets project managers excited. This is our rough expectation of how we're going to work on the different phases that we that I talked about before. So pull inventory, we should have the vast majority, if not all of the pull inventory done for the whole district um, done this year. And the high level design also. It was not, um, um, it was not, it's, it's not a terribly big deal to do the high level design. We added Waterbury sort of at the end after we had already budgeted for it. Um, we had figured out a way to make it, uh, to make it work out. So I think that's, um, that's doable. Pull inventory is a little bit more expensive, so we'll need to we need to think about how we're going to do that. Uh, detailed engineering. That's um, once you have the high level design. That's the specific network design at that point. And then we got make ready construction service. So you can roughly see year to year um, where we're likely to have service. Next slide, thanks. So. Um, 
based on our funding sources, we, are, we have to make decisions about what the monthly rates are. Um, by all accounts, we're getting a lot of uh, funding, a lot of federal funding, and that will necessarily drive the cost down to quite a bit below where we thought we would be um, before COVID hit. So it's still a you know, $46 million project when you look at it soup to nuts. So and it's, it's still, it's not gonna all get covered by grants. So the more grant money that we have, the lower the subscription rate. So um, actually, if you go to the next slide, I think there's, a, there's an interesting calculation. So EC Fiber, which is the communications union district to the south of us, they charge $72 a month for their sort of basic rate. Um, basically half of that is just their debt service on their revenue bonds, which is, which is wild. So, you know, we can cut that, we can cut that price and we're working from rather similar numbers. I mean, it's, it's a little bit later, um, you know, they bought the fiber and they did this when it was a bit cheaper before there was a bit of a rush on some of these, um, these resources, but, um, we're looking at, you know, similar numbers. So. I'd say you know, sixty dollars a month, fifty dollars a month is not is not out of the question. Um, so the next the next slide. Um, every town has a an allocation of ARPA funds to build broadband or wastewater or water or COVID recovery. So we would very much welcome the opportunity to um, <coughs> use some of the ARPA funds to fund some of the construction, some of the project here in Waterbury, um, if there is, if that's something that you're still um, thinking about doing. There are um, folks from the Vermont um, Community Broadband Board that are working with the League of Cities and Towns now to just, to essentially come up with some templates of how this might work. So with, so with all of the towns that are in communications union districts, how that agreement, um, how that agreement might look. Like, what, what are you getting for the money? And to have some specific language and some specific agreements for how that, how that would work. So, next slide. Is the 25-25, is that down and up? Is that what that? Down, down and up, right. And that's, I mean, so, that's what, that's what EC Fiber offers it as their base rate. We're really looking at probably more like 100 100 and be, being capable of gigabit or 10 gigabit uh, for those folks that, that want that. Um, so unfortunately, they, did, they highlighted the wrong one. This, the, 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 yeah. the, this is Phil's old one. Yeah. Um, um, Ray's old one, anyway. So uh, Waterbury's a bit farther down. Yeah, the, the, the last time I gave this presentation, it was much bigger, which they got a slightly smaller allocation, as you might imagine, than Waterbury. And those numbers are also, um, even when I presented those to Marshfield, these were not the right numbers, but they were the right order of magnitude in a race. That's... Um, Close to our, I think our total is going to be about 1.5 something in that vicinity. I, I, I think this this was from some preliminary numbers that we had gotten from um, Central Vermont Regional Planning. And we've received half already. We'll get the second half. So we've got 700 and something thousand in the bank right now. So. And you get the other half next year, I think, yeah. right? So. And we'll be talking about ARPA and what things that we might be able to use for it and all the different formula, not tonight, but we'll get there. But this is a definite high priority of the, of the state and federal government, I think. Uh, broadband is something that specifically was named out that you could use for this ARPA water, sewer, broadband. Uh, surface transportation, you can't use ARPA money for that. So roads, bridges, that kind of traditional stuff, they're hoping for a different infrastructure bill to come down the line to help with that. But this 1.5 that we'll get between now and early next year, you can't use it for paving or any other surface transportation. So. You mentioned base subscription rate. What are you looking at like for a residential customer as a base subscription rate? 
that's something we're still trying to figure still out. Still try. I figured that was going to be the yeah, answer. Yeah. So, so I mean, um, no, no ballpark-ish well, numbers. So, I'd say fifty, sixty dollars is probably not not out of the question. I mean, okay. it, it depends entirely on how much grant money we get. Um, you know, how much, you know, town ARPA money. Um, you know, towns are willing to share their ARPA money with us, and how much the right. how much the actual capital stuff costs. All right, it's a moving target. Yeah, it's, so it is a moving target, and we don't want to set it too low because we don't we don't want to be three years down the road and find out that we don't have any sort of capital reserves to um, you know to go and finish the network, and then we're stuck twiddling our thumbs or jacking up everybody's rates to in order to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all of our, um, because we're a municipality, you know, all of our meetings are open meetings and we have public records. So all of our, our you'll be actually seeing a budget from us um, quite soon in, in an annual report in the next couple of weeks that will go to all of the number of towns for comments. So you can see specifically uh, a breakdown of, well, you, I mean, you're doing your budget right now, I would imagine, or, or should be getting started soon. Um, for the end. Okay, so so in in Berlin we always started <laughs> we always started at the end of August, beginning of September, for some reason. But um, it's it's this, the same sort of thing. But it's but we have a we have a massive amount of um, capital expenditures to spend here, and that lights back on. By the way, it's suggesting that's maybe muted again. Are there connection fees yes. and equipment costs up front as well? Yeah. There, um, there probably will be. Um, this is something else that sort of figures into um, how we set the monthly rate because there's necessarily equipment and the line that runs to every house has a cost and it's not trivial. So it could be you know, fifteen hundred dollars. So we don't charge fifteen hundred dollars, and so if folks you know pre-subscribe, we're going to charge less for that. Um, but that's actually one of the avenues for the ARPA funds. That could potentially be um, potentially help us and help folks in Waterbury. Where you say we're just going to cover folks the cost of folks drops, and then we can say, okay, well, that, we don't have to sort of amortize that out and charge for that anymore. Thank you. You can keep going. We've already had that, and so this, yeah, unfortunately, this is not the newest. Um, this is not the newest one that actually had the. Uh, Jump the map also. Oh, oh yep. Wait, we have that. Any other? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there it is. Wonderful. So you can see the thanks, Linda. <laughs> so you can see the the uh, folks in blue are those that, um, according to the um, uh, Department of Public Service, the folks in blue have at least twenty five three, which would, which would be cable typically, and then the folks in red and some of the outlying areas. Only have DSL, so that's you know internet over their copper phone line. Is that the campground in the like? Yeah, that's the campground, right? Yeah, a lot of old. If, well, yeah. So these are all E911 addresses. So if each if each um, pad has an E911 address, then that 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 comes into the Department of Public Services. Formula. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah, happy to take any other questions. I mean, I have a question. Uh, right up front, you have a finance and audit uh, committee. Um, who are your financial auditors, especially in light of the Burlington Telecom thing? I'm quite familiar with a lot of the auditors around the state, so I'm just curious who you use. I'm on the finance committee. So yes, yeah, so okay. we, but we can't. So because we are in the process of hiring a okay, so you're and hired. hiring an auditor, we have not. I don't think we've actually pulled the trigger on either of those we folks have not, yet. But okay. We've been interviewing, so yeah. we are getting close. And uh, yeah, so we and the folks that we've talked to are folks that that I've been familiar with in my previous life. <coughs> They're good and bad auditors. Sure. That's and so, why Burlington Telecom got the drug. So, so I should mention about Burlington Telecom, one of the reasons the statute is written the way that it is to create that tax firewall between us and all of our member towns. There is not a way that we could you know, force you to incur indebtedness on our behalf. 
It's just not, it's not possible by the statute. So there can't be any trickery um, or sort of creative bookkeeping, shall we say, like there was with the Burlington Telecom. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So this process kind of lends itself in order to work properly based on a kind of a chain of command and starting with the, the major utilities um, doing their work. Uh, I know that on one particular project that I've got, um, Washington Electric's been better than five years trying to replace two poles. Uh, in fact, they just barely got the two poles stood and um, that's all they've done. And it's been weeks since that. Um, <clears throat> you know, all across the nation, there's shortages in, in manpower, um, and we're, you know, we're throwing money out there expecting that all this infrastructure work and everything's going to get done, but we haven't even got a handle on the manpower yet. Um, is there a, a expiration date on these grants? Um, the, the, that the, depends the on the work being done at a within a certain amount of time? Yeah, so your UMPA funds have to be committed by, and please correct me if I'm wrong, have to be, uh, have to be committed by 2023. Right. By the end of 2023, they have to be expended by 2025 or, or six, well, or, or something like that. But yeah, there's a little end bit of time. 26, I think. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, if you don't spend it, you obviously have to get it back. But I mean, you, you do have quite a bit of time to choose what to do. Um, but, so, but going to the, the, the conversation of resources and uh, manpower, we've not run into the situation yet where we've not had enough interest in getting, um, we've not had the manpower to get the things done that we need to get done, like the poll inventory. The way that we did it is we said, we know that there's likely to be a lot of demand for these folks. So we had a whole bunch of folks um, respond to the RFP, and we chose three of them. And so now they're doing, they're doing it in parallel. And so when, when they're done with their own individual projects, we'll be able to engage them and have them do the next part. Um, you know, and those folks, all three of them, are interested in doing and bidding on the construction. So as from, from my perspective, from our perspective, CP Fiber, I don't see that in the short term. I mean, may, maybe down the road, if they overcommit themselves, that, that could be the case. But we've also been around a little bit longer than some of the other CUDs and have, have like made some of these relationships already. Um, and as for like the actual fiber and the equipment, um, the fiber we have, the state is looking at getting in, uh, essentially doing a bulk purchasing, like you might with you know, like with the salt, right? You know, they they do have a big state contract for salt, and the towns can get in on it. So the state's essentially doing that for fiber and get and setting aside X number of miles of fiber for next year and then the year after that the CUDs can get in and buy through that contract. Well, on this specific utility that I was working with, not only did they tell me that there was staff issues, but they also had trouble even getting the poles. So it's, you know, it's... So for, from, from what Wex told me, they actually have, uh, at, at this point, they have a number, they have a, a stock of poles at this point. We have a memorandum of understanding with them, a, a contractual relationship with them, because they are they are a partner in this. Because they will be leasing out um, some of the fiber to do smart grid with every WAC subscriber, um, and in fact, they will be going out to the rural utility service to get their own their own loans to build some of the infrastructure and lease it back to us, or we may do a trade. So we're sort of going to be working from the same notes, from the same engineering, and they will likely be building part of it, will likely be building part of another one too. So, um, so WEC may be old and maybe slightly slow, but they've been picking up the speed a lot. We, we, we have meetings with them every week, like li literally every Thursday. And they've hired a dedicated, or they've contracted with a dedicated um, fiber engineer specifically for this project. So I got a quick question for you, Bill. Um, does the town recognize class four as part of their count for? Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't matter, we do. If people live there, if there's E911 address, 
Right. It's on our map. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the board or then I'll go out to the public for any questions? I'd just like to mention that Chris, uh, Christopher in here is our alternate. Um, we have both co been coming up to speed for the last month. Um, we've both got on two committees. Um, uh, looks like I have uh, committee meetings once a week uh, on different committees and then the, the general uh, once a month for the whole all, all delegates, the governing board. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to serve the public uh, of Waterbury in this. And it's very exciting. I'm enjoying the work a lot. I'd like to request that we put on the policy committee. Um, there's not too many on it at the moment, and I think I can help with that. So, uh, To get on a committee, you need to be uh, approved for at the, at the general meeting once a month. So, And that would put me on three committees. That's okay. We can also point out that anybody who's listening right now, you don't have to be a board member to serve on these committees. Any sort of volunteers or folks mm -hmm. that feel motivated like they want to help can certainly send us a message. Info at cbfiber.net, just say. This well, is a really the, important issue. I think the board would, would agree with me and say that uh, we certainly appreciate your mm -hmm. devotion and time and yeah. effort yeah. in this project. Yeah, very impressed with Thank you. Thank you. It's really, this is a really important issue. I've been working with the legislature um, for three years to try to get more broadband to rural communities. So yeah. I am thrilled that we're moving ahead with this. Thank you for all the work you are all doing on this. It's amazing. Um, anything we can do for you as a town? Yeah, talk about the grant money. The ARPA funds, that's really the punchline. Yeah. And the ARPA funds, the use of those ARPA funds would be used for Nothing so, else in the project, or could be used in a lot of different ways. That would be a town attorney question and a League of Cities and Towns question. So, the League of Cities and Towns has been they have been briefed, um, and they should have a. They're, I think it, they're they're putting together like guidance for towns about this. They it's, already. it's pretty broad. Um, the 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 town has the ability to uh, subgrant, if you will, this to uh, other municipalities, to private not-for-profits, you know, uh, not in this case, but, um, and once that grant is, subgrant is made by the municipality, uh, as long as it's an entity that has an appropriate use for the money, it's really, I don't think it's gonna have to be we need to know that you're using it for these five plugs and these four drops and you know it's goes into your project so i think you know we'll be talking about this probably sometime in december and then during our budget process in the spring um, as was indicated uh, we don't have to make all of our decisions until 2024 so there's there's a lot of time and i'm sure there'll be communication back and forth between this group and us, so we'll figure it out. And what was the grant that you said you found out was awarded that Linda didn't know about? What was that? So that is, um, that came, also came out of the ARPA funds, but came through, uh, it was allocated by the legislature um, for pre-construction just for communications union districts. So there was, um, I think it was a total of $150 million, and they took $30 million just for the pre-construction part sort of divvied that up across all the nine CUDs. And then we, we applied for a portion of those for uh, for what we're doing in our towns. And that was the, uh, so we submitted that a, a month ago now and have been in pretty constant contact with uh, the broadband board. And yeah, they just they had their meeting in Montpelier this afternoon. So it was just a couple hours ago that I heard about this. Anything else anyone from the public wish to ask any questions or comments? Thanks again for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Everything you're doing. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks, Chris. Um, next on the agenda is your select board business interview candidate for cemetery commission appointment. What's the 
select board know who the candidate is? Is the candidate here? Yes, I'm Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Carla, Carla Lawrence, the town clerk, uh, got sick and had to leave and go home. So yeah, you can come up here. Sure. If you would introduce yourself uh, sure. first, and then I've got a little segue, and then we'll get back. Yeah. So uh, my name is Amy Kinsell. I live in Waterbury. I grew up here. I moved here when I was six. I grew up on Spruce Haven, and currently I live on Crossroad. How do you spell your last name? Uh, K-I-N-S-E-L-L. S-E-L-L? Yep. Okay. So um, for the select board's um, edification, uh, you all remember Jack Carter passed away uh, several months ago. Jack was on the cemetery commission. Um, he has two years left on his term after we get to March 1st. So um, the cemetery commissioners uh, spoke with Amy at their last meeting. Um, Mrs. Walton is here, she's a cemetery commissioner, and uh, she can speak to that. The cemetery commission has recommended to the select board that you appoint Amy. Uh, and the way it works, I think you probably know this, Amy, is that your appointment um, to the commission is through the end of this current election cycle that we're in. So. Um, if you make an appointment, the appointment will, will be until next town meeting, and then on the ballot for 2022, there would be the normal five-year term for one of the cemetery commissioners whose normal term is up, and then there'd be an opening to fill the unexpired term, and Amy and anyone else would be eligible to run for that. So the appointment is just until town meeting. That you can ask for. What was the sorry? What was the length of Jack's term? He's got two more years after we get to March. Yeah, any questions? Uh, is continuing and running for that open position something that you have in mind after this? Absolutely. Term? Yes. So a little background. So I'm in the Navy Reserves, and one of my primary duties—it's a volunteer duty—but I do a lot of. Um, funeral honor details for uh, Navy veterans. So I travel all around the state and in New Hampshire and, you know, do funerals. And like in that time, I've really grown to love cemeteries. And like, I've developed a lot of good relationships with like funeral homes and different things like that. So it's something that I, you know, I've, as weird as it is, I really enjoy cemeteries. And once I saw this on Front Porch Forum, I thought it would be a great way for me to learn that piece of the cemetery. Thank you for your service. Thank you. You kind of answered my question. <laughs> I was wondering what kind of background you have that would, and that, that answered it. But thank you for your service. Thank you. Any other questions? No, sound great. <laughs> thank you for <laughs> yeah. volunteering. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Answering the call. Um, I'm assuming we need to make a motion. Yeah. I make a motion to approve. Uh, it's at a meeting. Yeah. It's the last Kinsel. Kinsel. Kins Kinsel. Uh, for the uh, unexpired term oh, of to Jack appoint, To appoint. Until March 1st. To appoint until March 1st on the Cemetery Commission. A second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you for your new service. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. All right, next up is uh, we moved, for those of you who joined us late, we're moving up the banner policy and banner discussion continuation of last week um, to now. Um, we are going to limit discussion to individuals in two minutes just because we have quite a few people attending tonight. Um, I think we're going to just have to start with talking about um, what exactly we're discussing, but also um, I do want to make note that um, similar to town meeting, I want to refrain from anyone cheering or clapping or booing. I think both are not um, appropriate ways to um, handle a meeting. So I would I ask that anyone refrain from doing that, and we will try to give everyone an opportunity, but also know that we do have 
agenda we need to get through. So I want to give everyone an opportunity, hopefully, to speak. Um, yeah, so last week, as I was unfortunately out of town, um, we know that we had a request from the local um, anti-racism coalition to fly a Black Lives Matter banner in front of the, um, on the banner pole, um, which we had done in the past. Um, there was discussion surrounding the banner poll usage and requests from individual organizations. And if and anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I did watch the meeting twice to try to fully wrap my head around the discussion. Um, you know, discussion surrounding whether we should, if we were to do it, hang it on behalf of the town or first on behalf of an organization and certain actions through motions could open us up to maybe other organizations requesting similar action from, from the town. Um, there was discussion about um, what the messaging was, if it was political, um, and there were discussions on both sides of those arguments. And then also there was, um, towards the end of that discussion, a request of a, a different banner that brought in the declaration of Inclusion, which the board adopted, I believe, last year. Um, I know there was uh, some participation that evening, and then I believe all board members have gotten additional um, commentary from the public. Um, so I think tonight we'll continue the discussion, but I think we also have to be conscious of time. So with that, um, I don't know if we want to start with um, I believe there was a quest of a new banner, and I don't know if anyone's representing work tonight to discuss if they've discussed wanting to do a new banner, or maybe we just opened a public discussion on feedback from last meeting. How would the board like to proceed? Uh, well, I. I'm not sure if like if we do it now, but I I support and want to um, move forward with the idea of hanging a banner with a piece of the statement of inclusion. Um, I don't have that sentence drafted. I don't know if someone did. Oh, I did. I have a different draft that I was working on too. But yeah. So is it is it in our email that I can pull it up or no? I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know where it is. I mean, I have the declaration of inclusion. Unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't know if we wanted to do that together to pick the words, um, but I support moving forward with that, and I would love to be, pro you know, actively decide on that tonight mm -hmm. in this meeting if that's something that we're all amenable to. So, Mark, I don't think last week, uh, I, I think that we kind of closed that this discussion out with the thought in mind that at the next future meeting we would discuss the possibilities of trying to frame. Um, some form of banner to everybody's liking, if that's possible, uh, using uh, the Declaration of Inclusion, um, some maybe edited version of it or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, it, it wasn't tasked to any of us to try to come up with some right. wording prior to this meeting, so right. no. that's kind of where we landed last week. Uh, I, I agree with what Danny said. I'm very much in favor of flying a Declaration of Inclusion banner because I think that is what the town stands for, inclusion, diversity, etc. cetera. Um, again, I, I don't think we may have the words as of now, but I, I at least think that if we craft some sort of wording that it's my impression that we have universal agreement to fly that, that banner. The question is, and maybe I do want to hear from the public as to other banners. And before commenting, I would like to hear from the public. Sure. Um, Bill? You know, just two, two quick things. Uh, at the last meeting, you did ask me to get an opinion about banner poll and your policy. I circulated that in an email a few days after the 
after the uh, meeting, uh, there is some um, concern if you were to allow a group to put up a, a sign that was speech, that you would have difficulty not allowing other uh, groups to put up other speech. You don't get to edit their speech. You don't get to look at what they want to say. If you're allowing <coughs> organizations to put it up, then you kind of open the door to uh, almost any organization with, with some very fine um, exceptions. The town can use the banner policy that it has in place and just say it's to advertise events. And if you did that, it is um, any organization can advertise any legal event. So if somebody wanted to put a banner up that says there's a Black Lives Matter rally on January 1st, that can go up. And if somebody else wanted to put up something else that was, I'm not even gonna try to figure out what it might say or what the rally would be for, but it was something that you didn't approve of, you still have to hang that banner because it's an event. Uh, and the banner policy that we have now, would that would be the case for any organization right now. Um, the other thing that I didn't talk about at the last meeting, and this is more uh, kind of technical, uh, Nick Nato, the recreation director, contacted me the day afterwards and he said, you know, I know the request was to hang the banner up for the full month of October, but we have a process in place where organizations make reservations. And he said, you know, you just can't give people carte blanche to put it up without checking first to make sure there's going to be room. So that's kind of a technical issue. So with those things, carry on the discussion. All right, how do we want to organize this? So in the past, we used to have a microphone. People could line up. We don't have a microphone. So. Um, Come up there and sit at the chair. Yeah, so I think we'll just. Maybe just sit in a line along the. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, if you just want to line up on the seat, so we can take the, the hot seat, if you will. Yeah. And that, yeah, for. This helps. We actually have lined up speakers, so people know when. Sure, but there are also other members of the public yeah. out there. Um, I think we're just going to have to do it as yeah. I asked uh, someone who wants to speak first, more than welcome to take a seat. We do have some um, folks that are on Zoom as well. For this, I can just see who raises the hand icon and then write it down in the order I see it and then go to those. Yeah, that'd be That's great. Good um, we will try to do this as orderly as we can. Um, and then please limit discussion to two minutes apiece because um, there are quite a few. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Are we discussing up here the use of the banner or the length of time the, the banner? What is it we're discussing? I, I've read all the notes and everything. I think I'm some of it is going to be feedback from last week's discussion, oh, okay. which was originally a request of being a Waterbury Sands and Black Lives Matter banner. Okay. Um, no, there was no action taken last week, and there was discussion of modifying that request because ultimately, as far as I understood from the discussion that I watched on the recording, was that um, any, any motion would be on behalf of the town. If we did it on behalf of an organization like Mark, then we potentially open ourselves up to a precedent that we would hang any banner off a request from the group. So um, I think that's kind of where the discussion led. Um, but through feedback that I saw online, through my email, phone calls, I'm sure the other board members know that there are, are folks that wish to speak that did not attend last week. So I, I think it would be appropriate to at least continue some of that discussion and allow those who want to give feedback on what they saw or heard. I think it's appropriate to give them an opportunity to speak to the request. Can you just clarify that it is that it is okay for the select board to vote on um, the fact that you know some community members would like to have, um, for example, a lot of race students with black lives matter in their home, and if the town votes on it, then that then it would be acceptable to um, so, have it as sponsored by the town. So to, to clarify what I said a minute ago, 
if last meeting the request was made by war for the town to allow Wharf to hang the black Waterbury supports Black Lives Matter. The legal opinion that I've got suggests that if the town allows Waterbury Area Race Anti-Racism Coalition to put up a banner, then it would have to allow any other organization to put up a banner. Regardless of what the speech is, because you're allowing organizations to do it. If the town select board votes in the name of the town, not giving more permission to do it, but in the name of the town to hang up something that says Black Lives Matter or the statement of inclusion, the town select board has the right in the name of the town to speak for the town. And then they could say, if some other group came and said, we'd like you to put this up, the town could say, that's not how we feel, that's not language that we support, and not a sentiment we, we support. So the, the fine line is between allowing a group to do something and allowing the town to make a statement. So the select board can make the statement, and then that, that could be the only statement that they ever want to put up there. But if you allow a group to put up a statement, then any group can put up a statement. No, they, they would have to vote for that group to put up a statement. No. You're not doing it out there. You're not if you, the motion is not, we are putting this up on behalf of a group. We are putting, if we were to do any kind of, whatever the motion is, whether it's we paint a street or a banner or whatever, we're saying we do those motions on behalf of the town, not a specific group, I believe, correct? Right. So that's the difference. Right, so I guess my question is if we as a board are asking the selling board to vote for the bill, what about the state of Black Lives Matter? On behalf have, of the town. On behalf of no, the We can't do it in, if they do it in, if they, if they allow Warp to, to hang that, then they would have to allow the Proud Boys to hang whatever they want. I get that one. Right. So, and I'm not saying you should not, and I think the selling board has a responsibility here to actually take that. And if the Pride Boys come to you asking for your vote, I would love for you to vote to take that vote. And that is your responsibility. That's not that's what, what he's saying. Happen. So basically, it would mean that it would not go to vote. But basically, it would set legal precedent that we will hang banners on behalf of groups. And there would be no vote. There would be. It would basically not allow us. And I, I'm right. Totally. I, I think I'm speaking this right. correctly is that it's, if we do it on behalf of war, that then if another group comes and we basically, they're like, well, you did it for war, why won't you do it for us? And we don't have, we would basically not have- You would have to do it. We would have to do it. The other version is that we as a select board or it ends up on town meeting day as a line item that the town can vote on, but the town makes a decision to make action on whatever it is, whether it's a mural or a banner or whatever, and you're, you're still keeping, keeping that voting here without allowing groups to just come in and put whatever rhetoric they want up. Yeah, right. So I believe that's the difference. That okay, but well, I have some, I want to respect all the people who can Yeah, can we so um, just, yeah, do we want to can someone, someone can you, start? whoever's speaking, can you just come sit in this chair because there's a microphone there, there's people on Zoom, and you have to speak loudly <coughs> to let the owl pick you up. So whoever wants to start. Are we starting on our number Yeah, you can just come, you can yeah, you can just come right up. Um, whoever wants to speak next, uh, whoever wants to speak next, if someone wants to speak next, just please move over to the chair. I think we should do Erin next, because she's yeah. had her hand okay. raised after. OK. And then um, if you could just state your name and if you're a resident. And <coughs> um, I'm just going to pull up notes really quickly, sorry. No I guess I don't need notes for my name. Um, <laughs> I'm Ashley Laporte. I just moved to Duxbury recently, actually. Um, and I wanted to call, I just wanted to come and state that my opinion, that it's really important for us to put up specifically a banner that talks about Black Lives Matter. And I think um, quite often that phrase is billed as being political and divisive. Um, and I think there's now federal legal precedent that says that that's not the case, unlike Confederate flags, for example, um, or white supremacy flags. And I think already the conversation today has like tried to equate those things. Um, and I want to talk about why it's important for us to like not do that. Um, and 
the federal precedent is just around the Hatch Act, which the U.S. officer, the U.S. Office um, of Special Counsel, looked at the Black Lives Matter flag specifically, and deemed that people who work for the federal government in their free time and actually during work are able to display the BLM flag because it's not political, it's not meant to be divisive, it's actually meant to be a statement of inclusion. Um, and you know, I just I wanted to share a little bit of like my personal experience growing up. I grew up in Lamoille County. Um, my sister and I are members of the Fort family, which my mom has nine siblings. Our whole family that we grew up with is white. My sister and I are the only two black people in our family. And um, we both grew up in the Stowe school system and our whole lives we were told that like everyone in our family and everyone in our town doesn't see color. And that we were welcome and we were a part of the community and we were, um, valuable as a part of our community, but we were told that in a way that said, we don't see color, you're the same as everyone else. And we're not the same as everybody else. Like quite literally everyone can tell that by our skin tone. And this is one small anecdote that may not seem big, but like series of these microaggressions really had a, a negative impact on my childhood. And when I think about um, having children and then sending them to Harvard Union and to our schools here, I would really hope that they could have a different experience where as a community, we actually recognize difference and don't think that being inclusive is about sort of thinking that everyone's the same. And the one small anecdote was that we were a part of a dance group in Stowe and there was a rule that went out saying like, everyone who's a part of this dance group needs to wear a nude leotard. Um, and that's part of what is the costume. And we wrote in and said like, we can't wear nude leotards, I don't even know what nude means because nude for us actually means a black color, nude for all of the rest of our friends means a pale pinkish color. And um, because the mentality of that town was like, we're inclusive because we don't see color, we were told you still have to do that. And it wasn't until we were like physically in a different color leotard than the color of our skin that it hit everybody. But at that moment it was too late, like we were embarrassed and like on stage in front of our whole town wearing something that just continually pointed out that we were different than everyone else. And I know that that seems small and I could give many more examples that are like much more deep cutting than that. But this is really about like us carrying through the murder of George Floyd to a vision of our community where we acknowledge and we accept and we see that people are different and we don't use that as a way to make it feel divisive or like that's going to make people hate each other or cause friction, but we see that as something to celebrate. And so I um, appreciate and think that the statement of inclusion, inclusion is incredibly powerful. I think quite specifically the statement of Black Lives Matter is a thing that um, I would ask us to consider including in whatever banner we put up because it's really important to recognize that black folks in particular in our community are having a different experience and that we want to celebrate that. Um, thank I you for your time. You thank you. So you want two? Um, yeah, I think three. we have the whole okay. two, but thank you for Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Mark, yeah. no disrespect for the young lady, um, but in this particular instance, should we be allowing testimony from people from other towns? I think that's for the board to decide. I mean, I do believe that we should make sure that residents have an opportunity to speak, um, and then we can decide if we're going to open it up to non-residents, because I, I do believe that we're here to do the business of the town. And, and again, no disrespect for anyone who's right. not from Waterbury or lives in Waterbury, but we are here to represent the town and make the decisions on behalf of the town. So. I do believe that as of right now, we'll stick to residents, and then if non-residents want to speak, we can decide if we have enough time for that. But Doesn't the sign say Waterbury stands for? I just want to clarify. The sign says nothing. There's been no motion. The request last week was a sign that said Waterbury stands with. Correct. There has been no motion. There has been no action. So we don't know what the sign is that we're Correct. talking about? Correct. It's more following up the discussion of last week, specifically the BLM flag and feedback over the discussion. To so now we're talking about a BLM flag. The, what we're talking about right now, I think, is I believe the select board have indicated that 
allowing groups to fly a statement is not a good thing. I understand that. And I'm now so they're now they're talking. What the flag is we're referring to, because if, if we're talking about a sign that says Waterbury stands with or Waterbury stands by Black Lives Matter, or if it's just Black Lives Matter, I think they're different things. They have There's extent. no. Dis, there's nothing on the table. They're just asking. So what the are we discussing then? We're discussing last week's request for a banner that did say Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter. Just how we feel in general about that? Yeah. Okay. And the, and the feedback from the community that obviously is here tonight to discuss that conversation. <clears throat> I think that's why a lot of people have attended here. As well as the response and reaction to the, the informal proposal for a new banner with a statement of inclusion. Okay. Okay. So are we jumping to Aaron now? Yeah, we can go okay. to Aaron and then Dana. I think. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, my name is Erin Hurley, and I am from Waterbury. Um, and I do support the select board as an entity, as the leaders of our town, flying the, a banner that says Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter. You have voted before to fly that banner, and you've flown it for many months. Um, and I think it's really important to our town. I've heard firsthand from children in our town that they like to see the banner. Children of color are happy when it's up and feel more included. Um, I have heard from adults that they appreciate the banner um, and people of color um, who are in our town, in our community. Um, I think it's very important as a white person that we have banners and make statements in our town that are that show that we are working to be an anti-racist town that we are working to be inclusive and equitable and that we care they are more than symbolic gestures they show this would show that the leaders of our town understand the real importance of creating a home for our children that is inclusive and equitable and after viewing the last meeting which was pretty hard to watch um, and uh, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. WARC is an organization of many people in our community. Um, I heard select board member Chris Vien singling out Baroni Minter for actions that were done by WARC, which was not appropriate or accurate. accurate. Um, Maroney has been a leader, but is not alone in the work to make Waterbury a more anti-racist town. Um, the Waterbury Area of Anti-Racism Coalition formed 17 months ago in response to a brave then middle schooler from Waterbury who talked about the racism he experienced in our schools at a Black Lives Matter event in Montpelier. And since then, numerous members of WARC have engaged with the select board on various issues um, with opportunities of lear for learning too. And we're a very large group varying in age, race, background, experience. We currently have 95 WARC members with many more supporters on our mailing list. And we have well-attended monthly committee meetings and membership meetings. They're the fourth Tuesday of the month at 7 on Zoom. Email waterburyantiracism at gmail.com if you want to join. And, um, and I'm just going to say again, as a resident of Waterbury, I hope the select board will make a motion to fly the banner um, that we have that can be your banner, that Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter. I also support a, creating another banner that um, has language from the uh, statement of inclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Dana? Yeah, thanks. Um, Dana Allen, Waterbury, the guy who complains about speeding on Stowe Street all the time. <laughs> um, and kids on my lawn. So, um, I would support the town considering putting up a banner uh, with a redacted version or an edited version of the approved Declaration of Inclusion. Um, I think that that captures a lot of um, a lot of different groups and a lot of different intersections, and I think that's important. Um, I am fully supportive of Black Lives Matter, um, but I think that the established policy of using that those poles to, to fly event banners, it's a good policy. I don't think that we should engage in ad hoc policy creation for different organizations. It's a slippery slope, and I think that having something that the town has already approved of put into a publicly visible form um, would be a positive step. 
Um, and the only other thing I'd like to say is that I'm somewhat disappointed to hear members of the community creating false dichotomies, uh, equating BLM with white supremacy groups. Um, that was something that came out of last meeting. Um, BLM does not engage in hate speech. It has no history of systematized violent crime aimed at people based on their race. So I would hope that no one would confuse apples with oranges in that case. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chiomi McKibben. Um, I live in Waterbury. For those of you who are curious, it's spelled C-H-I-Y-O-M-I. -I. I get that constantly. Uh, I am half Japanese and half Caucasian. I moved to Vermont in 2016 from California, which is a predominantly um, a multicultural area filled with a lot of other mixed race people like myself. I didn't realize when I moved to Vermont that the mental health toll that would take place on me of being one of the only BIPOC people in most of the rooms I was in. There was a lot of stereotyped assumptions, um, things that were said that were very ar arrogant, ignorant, and there's always assumed that I was an outsider. A couple of years later, I was targeted of an anti-Asian anti harassment. And this, um, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. I was the target of anti-Asian harassment. This, luckily I was around friends who were able to step in and speak on my behalf and, um, and tell the person who was harassing me that it was not okay. This played a profound impact on my life and it, it carried with me the weight of always wondering, when I go outside, am I gonna be the target of um, anti-Asian racism again? And these feelings only amplified during the pandemic as the rise of anti-Asian hate and random violent attacks happened across the country. I joined the Waterbury Area Anti-Racism Coalition because I knew that I needed to find other BIPOC folks to have a community with, and I was tired of being one of the only BIPOC people in the room. And I also really wanted to make my town better for other people like myself, and so they wouldn't have to uh, deal with race racism like I did. In March 2021, when the Atlanta spa shot shootings happened, I was terrified, I felt alone, and I realized that nobody was checking in on me. Nobody was asking if I'm doing okay, how this is impacting me, and people were carrying on as life as usual, which was even harder to carry this weight, and nobody was acknowledging it. I knew that I had to do something, and I couldn't just stay silent. I didn't want to play the, um, the model minority. Jimmy, you just had two minutes. Two minutes, okay. I knew I had to have a protest, and that there's only one protest happening in Burlington, and so I decided last minute to have one in Montpelier, and I contacted the Waterbury Anti-Racism Coalition um, mailing list and told them I was gonna be out there at the Capitol, and they joined me, and they contacted their list as well. Being part of this group has helped me feel included. It helped me feel not alone. And I think having and standing up in solidarity with other people who are targets of hate and racism is really important. Having the Black Lives Matter sign in Waterbury has a big source of pride for me. And I don't feel as alone, even though I'm not part of the black community, because I know that they're part of my community as a BIPOC person. And I think it's very important that we have it standing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to just keep myself from rambling. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Mal Culbertson. I live in Waterbury, and uh, I support the town bringing back the Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter banner, um, in addition to a potential other banner uh, using our statement of inclusion. Um, but as the board uh, deliberates on this topic, I wanted to address a pattern of false comparisons. Uh, Black Lives Matter or anti-racism work more broadly has been compared to white supremacist organizations. Experiencing racism has been compared to being called a racist and the phrase Black Lives Matter has been compared with the phrase All Lives Matter. Uh, as the board considers the banners uh, we raise as a community and our policies around it, I think it's necessary to provide some clarity around the false comparisons that have been flying around. Uh, the global movement for black lives that rallies under the phrase Black Lives Matter is specifically a response to disproportionate violence that black people face at the hands of police and the criminal justice system. The phrase Black Lives Matter is not a statement of black supremacy, it's a call to recognize black humanity. Uh, 
as we've said before, the belief that Black Lives Matter is bigger than any political organization. Uh, the white supremacy groups that Black Lives Matter has been compared to uh, during the last board meeting um, exist, to ex exist for the express purpose of dehumanizing and eradicating people who do not meet their criteria for whiteness. Uh, these are organizations who have a long history of murdering and terrorizing communities of color all across this country, including in Vermont. To compare a nonviolent movement asking us to recognize that black lives have value to groups that seek to murder and remove black and brown people from the United States not only misses the point of Black Lives Matter entirely, but it gives credence to white supremacy groups. I'll also quickly say uh, that being called a racist or fear that somebody will call you a racist is not the same as experiencing racism. Any discomfort or fear that myself or fellow white neighbors feel around the topic of race is temporary and not at all equal to or comparable to the violence, pain, and dehumanization that people of color experience when experiencing racism. Additionally, the phrase all lives matter is not a comparable substitute for Black Lives Matter. Sure, uh, as, uh, it's a response uh, that was designed to pull focus away from the anti-blackness uh, that uh, pervades this country. Uh, and it creates a false notion that we all experience the United States the same way, with the same hurdles. Um, I had a little bit more, but I'll leave it there for time. But um, I hope by addressing some of these false comparisons, we can all agree that Black Lives Matter. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Tessa. I am a Waterbury resident um, and I support the town raising the Waterbury Stands with Black Lives Matter banner. Um, I wanted to speak to the claims that the Black Lives Matter banner and work as a group are actively exclusionary and don't represent everybody. Um, as a community organization fighting racism, work represents and stands with many identities, um, including indigenous peoples, black people, Asian Americans, and many others. Um, for me, as a Chinese American, I am always supported by and included in this group. Um, earlier this year, I asked to lead a moment of silence for the thousands of recent victims of anti-Asian racism, um, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, WARC members stood in solidarity with me and held space for me to honor Asian Americans in our community and across the country. Um, when a community is hurting and needs allies, you don't say, what about us or what about me? Instead, you work to uplift that community and work towards healing and change. The Black Lives Matter banner might be specific, but it's not exclusionary. Asian Americans experience racism and discrimination, but a banner that prioritizes, prioritizes black lives doesn't invalidate our identities and experiences. Recognizing racism that black Americans face doesn't take anything away from the lives of other oppressed groups. The banner is important because it represents empathy and solidarity with black community members and visitors to our town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, I'm Travis Beto. I'm a resident of Waterbury, small business owner as well, if that matters to anybody. Um, uh, I'm, I basically want to echo something that Aaron said, the uh, specific Chris calling out Maroney um, on certain things, on forcing uh, a banner to be hung up, for example, things like that. It came from last uh, last last meeting. Um, as I think you're noticing, uh, work is big. As what Aaron said, 90 members. We don't, are, we are not in lockstep with whatever Maroney says. I don't, I barely even know Maroney. I've talked to him like five or six times outside of work and it's been in the parking lot saying waving hi. So um, it, we are a diverse, diverse group. Um, we, it, I, I it takes away from the work that we do, and I kind of take that a little bit to offense. Um, uh, what else did I want to say? There was, uh, that was the main, main thing. Um, also, this is a political body. Every decision you guys make is political. So whether to hang a banner, whether it's for the Little League, or whether it's for water, revitalizing Waterbury, or whether it's for work, or whether it's whatever it is, it's a political statement. So I feel that saying political statements is a reason not to hang the banner is a cop-up. That's all I have to say. We have another hand raised. Are we going back and forth or? Um, yeah, if you don't mind. Not at all. Alyssa? Hi. Um, my name's Alicia Backman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a resident of Waterbury. I'm here today asking the select board to fly the Waterbury Stands with Black Lives Matter banner as an action to show both 
our community and visitors to our community, especially Black people and people of the global majority, that Waterbury is a welcoming and inclusive community. The Select Board has adopted a statement of inclusion as well as engaged in racial equity training. To me, both of these actions show that the Select Board is committed to equity and hopefully working to center it in all the work that you do. However, the ruling at the previous meeting that you as the Select Board of our town cannot fly the Black Lives Matter banner to me is not in alignment with the agreements of both the statement of inclusion and the racial equity training that you've engaged in. The flying of the Black Lives Matter banner is an action that puts the statement of inclusion in a public space in our community, which as I mentioned above and others have also mentioned, demonstrates that Waterbury is a welcoming and inclusive community. I ask that you take action and as a board agree to fly the Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter banner. And I also support another banner with the statement of inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jocelyn DeFalis and I'm a resident of Waterbury and I'm also a BIPOC. And I do not want to see the Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter banner flying in our town. I believe it to be a political statement. I would rather see something taken from our inclusivity statement being flown. And as the select board members received, but I'll tell the people that are here and to the internet at large, um, from the Black Lives Matter website, they say Black Lives Matter is an ideological and political intervention. They also say that the three radical black organizers, Alicia, Patrice, and Opal, created a black-centered and political will movement building project called Black Lives Matter. Um, there, I also sent you guys an article from Politico that where they're quoted on the heels of nearly six months of nationwide demonstrations that sparked an international movement against systemic racism and police violence, Black Lives Matter is expanding its influence into politics by forming a political action committee. The Black Lives Matter PAC will formally roll out, roll out its programs as early as Monday, according to Patrice, co-founder of Black Lives Matter. The committee plans to endorse the slate of candidates ahead of the general election, paying special attention to mayoral, county, sheriff, and district attorney races. And you can go read the whole article online, but my point is they're saying that it's political, and that's not what we should be doing. Let's just say that we include everyone. What happened to Welcome to Waterbury? We're glad to see you. I mean, we, we're here. We need our businesses to survive. That's what helps our community. So just something that includes everyone would be great. And then just on a completely different note, with the reviewing of the last meeting, I was curious as to the chats not being available, that those don't seem to be saved. What are the chats? In a, oh, oh the Zoom. yeah, I don't yeah. know that. I don't know. Because they are savable. So. Yeah, there's some discussion that Having the chats is um, a little bit not fair because folks out there are chatting, people in here can't respond to the chats, can't even see the chats, so there was a lot of discussion that the chats should just be not used at all. But it was being used, so that's the whole I thing, is that saying understand. that you know, it should be available to everyone if we're going to use it. Well, if we're going to use it, but I think that there's some consideration that it shouldn't be used, so. But I just wanted to say that just because it was being used and it no, wasn't I fair to everyone that. that we didn't get to see it. Yeah. But thank, thank you. you for time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, before we move on, is that something that we should add to a future discussion of like disabling the Yeah, I mean, it, it, the Carla probably would have mentioned it if she had been here, but right. we talked about it right. at the meeting a lot today. I'm confused why people couldn't use it. Is that What's something the, that What, what does it mean, oh. you, you use meaning add it to the minutes? Or what's the Right, so either we, like, do we disable it or do we save it so that people can look and it's part of the, like, yeah. save. I think That's disabling in the yeah. chat. What? I think disabling the I think chat so, is. and if people have something to say, they can just raise their hand. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, can I get a clarification on one thing? Yeah. Bill, you mentioned events for banners, and there's been no talk about content versus events. Can I get a clarification on that? So if you're addressing me, the, the banner, the policy that we have that was adopted in 2014 when we built the banner pole, 
when the Rotary Club donated it to us. It was to hang banners to advertise events. So there's no event being discussed here tonight. But the town owns the banner pole. And at last meeting, there was some question brought up. I spoke to an attorney between last meeting and now, and he said, if you live with your banner pole policy and advertise events, you have to allow every event that an organization wants to have to be advertised there. So Rotary Club, pie for breakfast, March 15th, you got to put that up. And if some other organization wanted to say rally at, at uh, Rusty Parker Park, whether the select board liked that organization or not, that's an event. It needs to be put up. The town, because it owns the banner pole, had a request from an organization last week to put up, and now we're debating whether Black Lives Matter is a political statement or not, but an organization asked to put up a statement. It wasn't advertising an event. So the select board said, well, not sure that we should do that. It doesn't follow the policy. The attorney said, if you allow Wark to put up a statement, then you would have to allow any other organization to put up a statement. And he said, the town can avoid that scenario by deciding the banner pole can be used for banners to advertise events, plus it can be used for the town to make statements in its own name. So to me, this, this discussion going on right now is, shall the select board, in the name of the town, decide to put up some banner that has a statement on it? So right, thank you. did I clarify it, Tom? Right, that's all, that would be a separate vote, almost. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amy Hoskins. I'm a Waterbury resident. I've lived in Waterbury for 18 years. Um, I'm also a member of WARC. Um, I joined WARC after the Black Lives Matter rally over a year ago. Um, but I'm also here just as a member of the community. Um, and I am, I'm a member of WARF because I believe in their mission, which is to support all marginalized groups and to stand against racial injustices against the people in these groups. Um, and WARF, as mentioned previously, has many members. Some are BIPOC, um, but most of them are white people. Um, and that's just a reflection of the percentage of populations in our town. Um, I support the town hanging the Water Race Dance with Black Lives Matter banner again, as it did before, to show the town's awareness of the particular injustices that continue against black people. Um, and the idea would be it could be hung for 30 days and taken down and then hung at some other time, and then banners for other groups that the select board would approve that um, that you know it would seem like it would make sense that in the name of our town the town would support um, those banners and those messages. Um, I think it's it's also fine to hang a banner with the town statement of inclusion or some statement of inclusion that everyone agrees upon, showing that the town stands against racial injustices toward all marginalized groups and the town's inclusive of all people. Um, but I think that just having that banner would, would ignore the specific message about Black Lives Matter and what that means. Um, I don't feel that the statement Black Lives Matter was intended initially to be a political statement, I think it was meant to get people's awareness about social values and human values. Um, the injustices that continue against black people that are well documented by statistics um, and that we hear from black people in this community, these continued injustices are the reason for the banner. Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that white people don't matter or that white people are bad or that black people should get special treatment that's better than how other people are treated. 
Okay. So just to just to close, I think that the message is that mistakes keep being made because we haven't solved this problem yet. And that it's important to have the banner as a reminder that there's still work to be done. And and it's it's just a reminder to be aware and to be engaged and to listen to stories, um, black people's stories, and to hear each other and to not be offended, but just to use um, the opportunity to to engage and try and solve these problems so we can all get along. Thank you. Thank you. You want to jump? To yeah, I'll you? jump to Noah. Noah. Oh, hi there. <clears throat> Thanks for uh, holding this meeting. I don't have that much to say on it, but I do just want to point out that our neighboring towns, uh, Montpelier and Burlington, have taken really big actions with, um, you know, painting Black Lake Matters on their main thoroughfares for everyone to see in a very permanent nature. And it seems like asking to fly a banner um, is a pretty easy, simple, and low bar to actually show some inclusiveness in our town. So I just think that's a point that I wanted to raise, and I hope that we consider uh, raising the banner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, my name is Laura Hardy. I live in Waterbury. Um, I've lived here for about 10 years. I'm also a seventh generation Vermonter. Um, I support, and a member of WARC, uh, I support the Black Lives Matter banner, um, as well as any other Declaration of Inclusion banner that you'd want to fly. Um, because I know that as a white person that lives in Vermont and whose family has lived here for a very long time, that I have privileges that people of color haven't experienced. Um, for one, my extended family's been privileged to own a lot of farmland in northern Vermont and be dairy farmers for decades. Um, I work in the food system, and I know that in Vermont, just 17 out of our 7,000 farms that we have here are owned by black people. And that's not okay. And that's according to the last U.S. Census. Um, and that's because of things like racist government policies and discriminatory lending. So it's time to prioritize people of color because of the harm that's been done, and that's through a Black Lives Matter, Matter banner. Um, and there's other examples like how people, beyond how people have been denied land access, but like how black people have been disadvantaged in healthcare, harmed in our education system, and lots of other social policies. So again, I just echo what Noah just said, like Burlington has this painted down the street. I would be, um, really sad if Waterbury couldn't just um, hang a banner. So, um, yeah, and especially was discouraged by the All Lives Matter discussion at the last meeting because, um, yes, everyone's life is important, but what we're talking about now are people who have long been discriminated against because of the color of their skin. A Black Lives Matter banner is a way to hold them up and show that Waterbury is a leader in this movement to make things right. So I appreciate you listening, and I hope you will decide to fly the Black Lives Matter banner. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie Karen, and I also live in town. So I moved to Waterbury in 2007, and I just scripted some rough notes. Some of them will have questions, so if anybody can jot those questions down and maybe answer them at some point, that would be great. Um, so I'm asking, would you please enter into your minutes those people who are Waterbury residents and perhaps where the other people were from. I think it's so funny to read through the fog. Um, I'm concerned a, a little bit about the taxpayer resources being used here. We have time and staff. We have a town manager salary, a town clerk salary, select board stipends, and staff time just to prepare for the meeting. I would say that this is a very divisive issue. Um, what has been proposed last week may serve a small portion of the town, but not the whole, possibly even not the majority. One question, how long has the banner already been hung in town? How many town hours would you estimate have been used on this matter? 
What other groups have been recognized in the same way? How can we best serve the town as a whole? Can we put our time and energy into that instead of continuing with such a divisive matter? I encourage an inclusive manner, like the one you talked about last week, um, for all as mentioned at the meeting. I, I was curious also about the chat and the attendance in the Zoom, if that's recorded in your meeting records. Um, does the town have a policy in which participants at your meetings are expected to address each other and the board? I was concerned about the voice level and the tone aimed at select board members at your last meeting. I end with asking the board who represent all Waterbury residents to please honor those Waterbury residents, all of them, by hanging only positive, fully inclusive banners, not banners that serve only a few. And yes, you are here for the benefit of the town. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. I'm gonna jump to online, Damien. Sure. Everybody hear Everybody me? hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Damien Amani Garcia. I'm 15 years old. Um, I used to live in Waterbury Center, but I've been living in Waterbury for like two years now, three years almost. Um, I just want to talk about the importance of the of the banner to me and the message it it sends. Um, I just think it's a it's a message of inclusivity. It's not saying other lives don't matter. It's saying Black lives do matter. Um, I think it's a misconception where people compare it to more extremist ideals, saying putting one race or ideology above someone else. And it's a message of um, good faith and love and appreciation and understanding. And it, it really does hurt to see people compare it to extremist ideals, um, which are messages of like hate and unaccepting. And I think I do support the idea of a more inclusive banner but I do want to see the Black Lives Matter banner still staying up. Um, it would be nice to have a banner that includes like um, Pacific Islanders, um, Latinx, um, just Native Americans, stuff like that. But I think right now it's like a tender time for, or a sensitive time for uh, BIPOC people in America. And it's important to keep our focus on it. And I don't want, the town of Waterbury to seem like we were just following the trend and then forgetting about it when it's not in the limelight, I guess. Um, I know when I like when I bike past that or I walk, walk past that, um, it just makes me feel accepted and uh, seen by the people of Waterbury. And it, it's important to me that we have that flag uh, or banner, sorry. Um, yeah. I support the, the Black Lives Matter banner. And I think we could work together as well to create an inclusive banner, but still recognizing the importance of the Black Lives Matter banner as well. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you. Um, I don't think I have much to say because Everybody already said a lot, but I'm just here to say that um, just like everybody, uh, I'm hoping that you all consider uh, taking a vote to fly the Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter. It's something that you had done before and it was up there. Uh, in addition to that, we, I'm also, we are willing to work with you all uh, to create a more inclusive banner based on the statement of inclusion that you had adopted. Uh, and I know last meeting, Katie even mentioned that maybe work can help with drafting that language. And so we're happy to work with you to create that for the banner. I actually, we actually took a crack at what that could look like. We're happy to present what we have created to you. That's not to say that that's the one you should adopt. It's because you had mentioned that we could help with that. So we took a crack at something that we could present. Um, but at the end of the day, this is for you, whatever you decide to create based on a system of inclusion. Uh, we are supportive of that. Um, we think that we can do both, flag that banner, uh, and also flag the We Stand With Black Lives Matter, which is something we have done in the past. So did you say you did hmm? work on? Yes, we've, uh, we've uh, yes, we've taken a crack at uh, creating something that we can present to you here today. You don't have to make a decision on it, yeah, obviously. I think it's fair. Um, yeah, if you have it, I think. Yeah. 
Okay, I can pull If you want to email it to me right now, I yeah, can put it up to it. share. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Yeah, it'll take me a minute. So yeah, you're good. If anybody else needs to speak, I'll just get up and Thank you. Any other speakers? Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Walton, and I live here in Waterbury as well. Um, it seems that there was a memo that must have gone out that told people what we're going to be chatting about tonight. My understanding was we were simply discussing what the banner policy was about. Um, I think that anybody that's here cares about people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. I'm assuming that's the case. But having said that, I'm really not understanding why the select board is feeling the need to prove that Waterbury is an inclusive community. I think that Waterbury has proven to be an inclusive community simply by the way that they behave and they interact. I know there's a lot of people that um, seem to feel obligated to go along with the idea that somehow we're inherently racist. I don't agree with that. I think there's a lot of people in Waterbury that wouldn't agree with that. And I just um, although I certainly can understand having banners that say this event's happening or that event's happening, I really don't understand why we're wading into a political arena here. To suggest that Black Lives Matter is not a political statement is naive at best. It may have started out that way, simply a, a nice thing to say, a true thing to say. It is a true thing to say. Black lives absolutely do matter, as do white lives and every other color that's out there. But I don't think that it is... Um, seen as being anything but political now. And I think that if we want to make a statement, if we feel like for some reason we have to make a statement, simply saying Waterbury welcomes everyone is a great thing to say. Or be nice to your neighbor, or have a great day, or smile. But staying away from this political statement is, in my opinion, the best thing to do for everybody in Waterbury. So thanks for everybody for participating in the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> didn't have anything to say. I was hoping I could get a little bit of saying something. But anyways, um, in a historical precedent, the Waterbury State Hospital, Vermont State Hospital, opened in 1890. And Waterbury's been home to uh, some of the most challenged and tortured uh, individuals for, you know, before many, many things ever happened here. And it has nurtured people and has continued to do so. It nurtured my three kids growing up here. Um, I've seen a lot of success stories. I know personally the governor is interested in the growth of this town. Um, and I, I support diversity, I support inclusion, and uh, I just, I hate to see the, the town being as divisive as it's been and as the meeting was two weeks ago, which is why I came tonight, and uh, it's nice to see civil discourse, and you know, I hope you folks are able to process this and move it, because having it be stuck is not doing really anyone any good, so that's what I, that's what I hope can happen here. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank Thanks, you. Tom. <coughs> anyone else? Yeah. Well, I, just, I was just going to start to ask you about concern time. for the time and the agenda sure. itself. Is, is there anything in your message that's way outside of what already has been said? Um, my perspective is as a parent and a Airbnb owner in the North Town, and so it's slightly different than other things that were heard tonight. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it. But. <laughs> Dear Waterbury Select Board, I am a resident of Moortown who lives on Codville Road and considers Waterbury Village my home. I am writing in regards to raising the Waterbury Stands of Black Lives Matter banner and the statement of inclusion and am urging the Select Board to vote in favor of raising these important banners. 
First, as a parent of a three-year-old and soon-to-be second child, I feel that it's essential that the children in our community are reminded of the values of Waterbury on a regular basis. As they are forming their ideas and beliefs about the world, it's essential that as a community, we stand up collectively to let our children know that in our community, we value equity and inclusion. The Waterbury Expands with Black Lives Matter banner is an inclusive symbol of our community's commitment to making sure all marginalized people and communities know they are welcomed in Waterbury. And its presence is an important message for all our children as they grow up here. It is a message they need to be reminded of and see often as they are discovering their own place and role in the world. Raising these banners today will have a positive ripple effect for years to come as children of this area grow up, learn, and live these values. Secondly, it's very important to me that all visitors to this area feel unequivocally welcomed to the Waterbury area. I believe this as a citizen and as an Airbnb owner. Unfortunately, my experience speaking with people of color outside of Vermont has been that people have fears and concerns about visiting the area due to its lack of diversity and reputation nationally. Waterbury and Exit 10 are basically the front door to Vermont for many tourists, and I believe as such, it's essential that we ensure as a community that all visitors to Vermont feel welcome. While these banners may seem like a local decision, such decisions have a great effect influencing the reputation of Vermont on a national scale. We live in a world of Instagram posts and Facebook groups where pictures or mentions of these banners shared elsewhere can have a positive, far-reaching effect on what people think of when they think of Vermont and actually visiting here. Um, so in conclusion, for these two reasons, amongst the many other critical perspectives shared by others tonight, I urge the board to vote in favor of raising both the Waterbury Stands with Black Lives Matter banner and a statement of Anyone else wish to speak? Move into the board. Um, first, before we discuss, um, I just want to say thank you. I know that it can be scary to come up and be vulnerable and speak, so I appreciate everyone for the bravery that it takes and the vulnerability and for the respect and um, positive discourse from that tonight's meeting. It makes a huge difference. Thank you, Danny, for saying that, and I echo your comments. We have also a co one with our Declaration of Inclusion, just to compare. Where's the dark blue? It's behind. So there's black and African Americans, indigenous peoples, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders, LGBTQ plus, um, neurodivergent immigrants, immigrants, um, people living in poverty, the elderly, people who have been living with mental illness. So you want all that on a banner? It's in the background of it. That's in the background. That's actually not. So it's a layer underneath that writing that it's there, but it's not in your face, but those are the communities that we're including. I think our thought was to take your suggestion of creating a more banner that's more inclusive of all the marginalized community. And so that's why we put all the marginalized community and individuals kind of in the background. Again, this is our proposal. No, no, I, I, I understand. I just wanted to ask. Can I say something? Yeah. Well, obviously, most of us 
haven't seen the top banner. But I'm, I'm quite sure you guys as a town probably spent a considerable amount of time on your inclusion statement. And um, I'm disturbed initially at, first of all, the yellow bolt, but especially the negativi negativity of the first line and that continued um, almost accusation to people. But, uh, but I, um, I think I just would really like to have some consideration of what the town has already created. I believe it was red. Maybe somebody could read it again. It's right, yeah, it's right, there. It's um, right there. Yeah, it's I right can't read it. Yeah. Uh, town of Waterbury Declaration of Inclusion. Waterbury condemns racism and welcomes all people regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity, or expression, age, or disability, and will protect these classes to the fullest extent of the law. As a town, we formally condemn discrimination in all of its forms and commit to fair and equal treatment of everyone in our community. Waterbury has and will continue to be a place where individuals can live freely and express their opinion. And if I correct Maggie, I believe that that was brought to us by the same organization, ORC. Well, you know, as um, Elizabeth mentioned, <coughs> you know, coming into Waterbury, you know, Waterbury, everyone's been Waterbury for a long time. It's always been, the things I love about Waterbury and the things, the reasons I say are your park events, your farmer's market, your community dances. I was here during Hurricane Irene and watched how amazing. Waterbury has so much positivity. And so perhaps, welcome people with positivity, you know, words of, I forget some of which you said, but <coughs> positive words of welcome and, and a nice, friendly, gentle voice. I agree. Welcome people to water. Let's not bring up negativity. There are welcome signs at the beginning of both ends of the town. Yes, of course. You notice there are welcome signs. I think at this point I would like to see the select board make a vote on a banner without the specifics here for a period of time that takes us to town meeting that stays up. And I think we need to, I don't know, if, I know Robert's rules of order allow a committee to just finalize what that is. I think this is too quick to make a decision on a Mm -hmm. banner we're just seeing but I would like to make someone to make a motion that gets that banner a banner that represents the, the statement of inclusion I, w I actually think it you got to be careful being too too many words on a banner I think it needs to be distinct and, and clear um, but I my quick reaction to that is it might be too much on a banner in terms of just the words and hoping that people as they're driving by read it and understand its message. So I would hope that we could at least, someone would make a motion and we'd get to the point where we can actually have a vote on it. And then I think we also need to discuss the Black Lives Matter banner. There's enough people that have come tonight to ask about it that I think that it, we owe that respect to discuss it and vote on it. I don't think and then, and I'm happy to have that discussion, but I just don't think that we should, but that would be for a period of 30 days. That's my opinion on where we take this. Um, I think, I think that as a town, we, we owe it to show the support for the BIPOC community. I think it's important that we're showing support for the African American community members that are asking that we represent them through this through this banner, just specifically, you know, I, I just don't, I don't, I think it's a mistake to not consider it or even put it to vote. So could we, could a motion include, um, how do we do that if we don't have specific wording and, and a time frame? So like that, could we make it a time frame of saying <coughs> from December to March, that gives us time to create the wording and create the I think we can do a motion to approve. I agree with Mark. I think the two things are segmented. You know, the dec I'm going to call it the Declaration of, Com of Inclusion Banner and the, you know, Black Lives Matter Support Banner. You know, there are two separate things. 
I think it, at least first we could come to some decision on yes, do we want to fly a declaration of inclusion banner for X period of time and we'll craft a subcommittee to do some word some wordsmithing. Because I don't know, my first impression of what was presented to us, one, I thought it was a little wordy. Uh, I wasn't that comfortable with the, so much of the words. I think what Mark said, I think you want to have something that's very succinct and brief, because people driving down are not going to read a whole bunch of words. Something like this, Rec Waterbury recognizes all people as one. Plain well, and simple. Let's let's work on what what. No, I'm just saying it. something is. of that. Yeah, well, let's work on something without crafting something right now. I wasn't trying to craft anything. Yeah, I'm just throwing out a suggestion. Okay. So could you help me structure that? Um, my intent with being the make a motion that we approve the creation of a banner that succinctly represents our statement of inclusion to be flown through town meeting day. But I don't know how um, that works. So, so you, you don't have the language now? No, right? without the language, how can I okay. make that motion and then? I think you well, can with you words. Can, you, can, you can make a, what you said. I, I didn't write any of it down yet. But what you said, you know, fly a banner from a particular, you know, mm -hmm. December 1st, January 1st, whatever, through town meeting day, and then you can say at the next meeting you know, the, the words. But oh, if you okay. want to make a motion to hang a, for lack of a better term, declaration of inclusion banner, you can just say what you said. Okay. And I'll write it down this time. So I'll take a crack at it. Uh, I move to approve the creation of a banner. Uh, that, uh, with a declaration of inclusion wording to be crafted at our next select board meeting that would hang, I don't know, from December through town meeting. Um, is that enough time for us to create one? Does that feel like? I think that's reasonable. I think that's fine. Okay. If we can't meet the deadline, we right. can't meet the no, deadline. Yeah. To be Motion crafted, been made. Is there a second? I second. There's a second. Any further discussion? You said to town meeting? Through town meeting today. And then we revisit it. Well, boards could change. I think that's right. why we do it until, until town meeting day. <laughs> um, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 So what did you all say aye to? We agreed to hang a banner through December to town meeting day that is a banner that represents our declaration of inclusion. Uh -huh. Since we don't have the verbiage tonight, we will present okay. that verbiage. I just want to make sure because it was, it's hard to hear. Yeah, no and problem. Just, I know I'm over 50, but you know, <laughs> Me too. Uh, it was no quite a difficulty hearing all of you tonight, especially when you have your mask on. But I just wanted to make sure I understood what you were voting sure. on. It's Thank you for just clarifying. It's one banner, so not right now, it's more of a generic statement about inclusion. Well, Is that about right? I personally think we need to have a discussion about the Black Lives Matter banner as well. So yes, that was what that vote was on, and then we're going to have a separate conversation about the Black Lives Matter banner in particular. So separate discussion. Yeah. Can I ask um, a question? Yeah, Does that mean the event banner is not available in the time that it's doing this other task? The banner poll? Right. No. The banner it's pole can down. hold four banners. Yeah, you can hold multiple. I think rarely we have four banners right. on that pole. How many do we have out there right now? I one couldn't tell you. Down. One. I'd have one out there. there. I drive by it every day and I never look at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just in the background. <laughs> so then the next question is, does the board call the question, do we hang a banner? saying either Black Lives Matter or Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter. And does anyone want to call that question? I think it's, I think it's worth discussing and voting on it. I just think that there's enough people that support that message that 
I don't think we should discuss it as a board and vote on it. I thought Katie did. I'm sorry, no. do you think there's enough people that support? I think there's enough people that support it in the community and don't and understand its message. And after I personally watched last week's meeting, I don't think, I, don't, I think that I support it and I would vote yes for it. And I don't see why we as a board can't do what we've done before. We've hung this banner before. Well, I understand that, and I think now you're getting some feedback having hung that up. And but I'm also get, we're also getting positive feedback over that. Well, you are because apparently I don't, someone's I don't, organized I don't believe, this to get those voices. But I think if more time I don't, is given, there will I don't be plenty of voices more, that we can get together that will oppose to, it. There's a protocol. We'll select board and run this meeting. If you want to speak, I'm sorry, Mark. I mean, right. it needs to be recognized. You can't have this. this I think we as a select board need to discuss it. And what, what do you want to accomplish? Because I would think the idea is to unify. This is this a select meeting. board meeting, correct? I understand right? that. So we are the select board. We've been voted into these I, positions. I understand that. Right. But, so uh, I'm, I'm going to say that and you've had the opportunity you said that to speak. And you weren't talking specifically about a Black Lives Matter banner. Mark, does maybe does anyone want to make a motion right. to include if, that banner? If no one wants to make a motion, there's nothing to discuss. There's nothing. So does anyone from the board want to make the motion? And I and I don't I don't typically make motions as the chair, but am I allowed to make a motion? Yes, you can. I will make a motion to hang a Black Lives Matter banner for a period of 30 days on the banner pole on behalf of the town. Right, so before so we have to have a second. second, and then we can discuss. I'll okay. second. So there's it's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Who seconded it? Mike? I, w I wish to discuss. I am fully supportive of the work WARC does. I am fully supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement. One of my heroes today passed away, Colin Powell. Um, I hold him near and dear. I thought he was one of the greatest Americans that have ever lived. But conversely, I do believe, I understand that the Black Lives Matter movement is not a political movement. We've gotten enough emails about that. But I do believe none of us run as Democrats, Republicans, progressives, or independents. We all run as people supporting this community. I think the prime, as much as, again, as I said, I do support the movement, I do think that the, what the select board does is we govern the municipality. I am very concerned as much as I say, you know, as much as I say I support these movements, where does it stop? Uh, are we going to see, you know, <clears throat> anti-vaxxing? Are we going to see anti-war, anti, you know, everything? I know, and people have raised this, uh, Burlington has had, you know, has has had different motions to support Black Lives Movement. If you notice, every one of their city councilors are elected in a partisan election. We're not. I do think it, it's a very slippery slope, as I think Bill, Bill Shepler kind of represented. I'm just so concerned, because we're here to run to make sure that the roads are paved, that uh, the municipality is safe, that we're taking care of town's business. As much as I'm so supportive of the Black Lives Movement, I don't think we can represent every group. I think the young gen gentleman, I can't think, I think his name is Damien, he kind of represents, it would be great to say, say everything. My wife's Jewish, she has experienced anti-Semitism. You know, I don't think we could, we could as a municipality. That's why I'm so in favor of our Declaration of Inclusion, and I'm proud of our Declaration of Inclusion, because I, I am against racism, 
I am, a, I am so much for inclusion, and I want to see our town being a welcoming community. So that's why, you know, uh, some people procedurally you say, well, you seconded the motion. Second doesn't mean that I'm for something. I'm, I seconded it because I want to see the motion put on the table. I, I am hesitant to approve a Black Lives Matter. And I, I would say, advertise in newspapers. Adver you know, a lot of groups do a lot of different ways to recognize what their, what their groups do. That's the way to do things. And I'm not saying, you know, I don't think by flying a banner on our post, which was paid for by the Rotary, you know, to advertise events, I guess I just don't see ways. You know, you could find, you know, business owners who are very supportive of the Black Lives Movement. Maybe they'll put a banner on, on their business, and that will accomplish the exact same thing. I just worry about the long-term complications of approving this, and we're just going to get in a very slippery slope. You know, people don't like abortions. Uh, you know, are we going to fly an anti-abortion you know, you, know, you know, banner. And I know people are saying, why are you saying this? I just think it's we're here to conduct the business of the municipality. And we shouldn't separate that personal opinion. So just to clarify, since you used my name in the slippery slope, <laughs> what I suggested right. was right. allowing organizations to use the municipal banner poll right. to state their opinion put you on the slope of having to allow other organizations. Right. I understand and agree with you that you're a nonpartisan board, um, but that doesn't mean that, that this board doesn't have a right to say anything about it. You can, you can vote whichever way that you want to vote, um, but don't get on the slippery slope of thinking that the select board has to wait until there's unanimity in the community to take an action. Because mm -hmm. there will never be unanimity on anything. There's right. a school bond bo vote that's happening. I'm not sure if the school board all voted in favor of it or not. But you can't just say, well, we can't take action because some people think this way and some people think that way. That's what you're here for. You ran to represent the town, and this is an issue that I think the discussion is, should the town support this? It, so you, you gotta make the tough choice. You can't just say, well, this is kind of, I gotta wait because some people might not like it. If that's how you wanna vote, that's fine, but don't put yourself in the position of saying, we shouldn't act on this kind of thing. So I have a question, but first, Mike, I just wanna... Sure. Um, the what you mentioned about like signs and for businesses and stuff, and that's happening, you know, around the right. country, seen, but it's not accomplishing the same thing. I think the request is clear, or to me, that it's the town making a statement, not individual business owners or residents. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't accomplish the same. Totally thing. understand, and that's where I think the declaration of include. Sure. I'm a very inclusive person, and I think the declaration of inclusion, if we could say something that's very firm, very proactive. That could do what I think the Black Lives Matter statement does. And then my question mark is that the the motion didn't specify. You said a Black Lives Matter banner, right. not specifically the water race stands with, because I personally would support a, a Black Lives Matter banner being hung, which I think is a different statement than saying water race stands with, because as we've heard, a lot of folks take issue with the like the organization, um, and it's we can you know. I, I specifically it, made right. my right. motion that way. Right. So, um, so, so your motion includes I, the no, I removed, no, I removed the water race stands okay. with because I that's, think that's been a point of contention. That's what I thought. Yeah. So. But the important message to me is that Black Lives Matter is the message that we're putting out as a town. And so that's why I made the motion. Thanks for clarifying. Can I just say Board want to hear any additional public comments? Sure. sure. Yeah, I just I mean we, we we I would have no problem would have no problem with the statement that says Black Lives Matter. It, it, uh, the problem is the fact that it is one of those things. So we have no problem. Yeah, I don't think it's 
problem as much as in my opinion it just created additional discussion that I was hoping that we could state the message without that component. Yeah. Any other board members? Yeah, okay. Um, so I would like to thank everybody who spoke tonight uh, online and in person. It was great to hear feedback from everybody. Um, I think everybody who spoke tonight about them being in favor of hanging the banner up that says Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter was also in favor of putting a banner up with the uh, Declaration of Inclusion in some form. So that was encouraging and especially that WARC wants to work with us and possibly put together a version and I'm still in favor of that and if we were voting on it. I personally would not vote to have the Waterbury Stands with Black Lives Matter. I would like to work together with a group and community at large to form a banner that includes our Declaration of Inclusion in a way that's safe for people to read while they're driving. <laughs> well, you've already approved that. We've already approved right, that. but the that's, motion yeah. is hanging a Black Lives Matter banner on behalf of the town. And then you also, that's you specifically said that Waterbury Stands with, would yes. your opinion change if it was if that was omitted and it was just a Black Lives Matter. Or I guess you don't have to say that now, we could vote, but just to clarify that that's it. I wouldn't know, I would want to hear more com community feedback on that first before finalizing my answer on that. My stance doesn't change. I believe that this town uh, and the select board itself duty is to take care of the town business for the fairness and equality of everybody that lives here. And uh, I will never change my mind about that. So, I'm gonna have to say that. Yeah, I think my biggest problem with what I heard last week and I was glad came out tonight is that Black Lives Matter is an inclusive statement. It's not a declusive statement, so I think that's what frustrated me the most about that discussion was that the, 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 and I do believe that even though this has found its way into the political spectrum, it should be a bipartisan conversation and that's why I believe you're seeing it in towns across the country. There are plenty of universities that do both statements of inclusion and Black Lives Matter messaging. I think that just because, I, don't, I just think that we as leaders of the community have to stand up for the small percentage of minorities and I believe that this is a great way that we could do that and I hope we continue as a town. We've hung this, a banner similar to this that said Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter that I believe the majority of this board voted towards or maybe if all this board Board, I can't remember if this is before this me. Board or the yeah. previous board. So to say that we haven't done this before or that anything's changed, I do fear that by not considering it or voting on it, acts like this is a, a, a short term reaction to a long term. This is a long term problem that I believe that the continued statement of Black Lives Matter is important in time. And until we as a society can prove otherwise, that I believe that it, it should be considered a continual message out to the community. I, I would love to see it take less of a political stage and it be bipartisan. I, I understand that not everyone in the community to, would agree to it. I totally respect that feedback, but I sit on this board representing people who voted me into this position and I believe that the people that voted me in would support town raising a Black Lives Matter banner for a period of time. I don't think, I think it does more good than harm. And I, I, it's unfortunate that the education of some in this town don't understand its messaging and think it's some sign of that saying that other lives don't, it's not, that's not the message. And I think that it's a very important part of the conversation. So that's why I would support it and I would support it tonight and I will support it down the road. And just to partly answer the question that the woman over in the corner asked, um, we have uh, begun 
uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training here. The select board has had two sessions of that. We're going to talk about scheduling a third one tonight. Um, I have taken a number of training courses, both through um, sitting with the select board, but also the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. This is a very, um, very cogent um, issue that's being discussed all across the state. The Vermont Town and City Management Association had a conference last week. We had a whole session on this. Um, I'm going to send to the select board later tonight or tomorrow um, a link that was given to me. Uh, it's a 21-day challenge to um, spend some time every day either, you know, it, there's a reading list, there's a small, you know, podcasts that you can listen to, small videos, many of which take two or three minutes to listen to. And um, I've learned quite a bit just in the few that I've watched to understand why the perspective that most of us have as white people uh, that we don't really understand how it is to walk in the shoes of those who aren't. So uh, if it's okay with the select board, I'll also be willing to put that up on the, the link up on our website and people in the community can look at it and take what you want from it. Uh, but I think it is very educational and it's helpful to understand um, how broad and deep this, this issue is uh, for, for many people in this country. I'm all in favor. Anything that we could do to, pro to promote educating people about inclusion and diversity, I think is a wonderful thing. So the motion's been made and seconded. I understand time is of the essence <laughs> and slipping away, but I also wonder about whether now or later it may be a time to discuss putting this matter on a ballot for a town yes. meeting day so that the community can vote on it. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, we discussed it. Right. Yeah, discuss I think it's a good idea. For next meeting. Like we can put it in the parking lot. I think any long term signage or anything should definitely go out to the voters. So, so if that could happy to discuss that down. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending this evening. We're going to continue on to our agenda items. We appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Do, I need, do you need all these names on here too, though? She has a sign in. She no, for the online. Katie. Oh, God. Katie. Hi, Karen. <laughs> Hi, Katie. I have the names. Oh, you're the best. <laughs> one of our jackets or one of theirs? I can send this to everybody, but just since we're here, I did this on my lunch break today. I just sent it to Maroney. There he is. I like, definitely not like a final, <laughs> but if we had to present something tonight, that's what I had in my... Anyway. Yeah, I, I try to read Robert's Rules of Order to understand because you can call to committee, right? So, like, we could, in a discussion, we could, someone could say, I, 
don't know what the terminology is. But what I'm saying. You can I refer it to a committee, but then it comes down to the crazy open meeting law, but we can't discuss that. You know, unless it's you know just a few of us. Sure. That's the problem. But you're right. Robert's rules can you can refer things to committee. All right. Moving on. Uh, discuss appointment of the emergency management committee. You skipped uh, Randall Street. No, oh, no, we moved. No, we're on month B because we and moved. You D. told us before you moved. Your name's P and D. D. So. Oh, I, sorry, I meant D above D, but yeah. that's fine. Um, we can go Randall Street closure for Halloween. Yeah, I'd just recommend that uh, you make a motion to authorize that. We've had a couple of requests from people. This will be the first trick or treating in so moved. So moved. I'm glad to see the kids can trick or treat again. Second. Uh, <laughs> and second. Any further discussion? Can't wait. All those in favor, say aye. 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 It's all right. It's Randall and <laughs> Randall and part of Elm Street. Right. Okay. okay, thank you. So Mike and Danny. Mm -hmm. Yep. Discuss appointment to the Regional Emergency Management Committee. You and Carla have been talking about yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Carla is probably I'm, I'm more than glad to be, you know, I didn't know, I know, I have participated in a lot of emergency management training. You know, as I think I've discussed to you, I deferred to Gary Dillon because, you know, el el elders' health and stuff like that. I just felt it wasn't in, in the town's best interest for me to have being the emergency management director. But I, be, you know, I participate with all the meetings, even I guess I'm considered the emergency management coordinator. Gary is. On this committee. Right, he's already a voting member. They're looking at a second position, member. And so I'd be glad to be the second member, or I know that sometimes they have the town manager or the public works. Is there any interest in you? Know, <coughs> you. What? <laughs> you, you. you. Okay, I'm fine. You know, I'll, I'll be glad to do it. All right, motion. Does that need to be a motion? Yeah. I move to appoint. Uh, Mike Barber is the regional emergency management to the regional emergency management committee. Second. Yeah, as a voting member. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Is there a term? Mm. Uh, I don't know. Oh. Well, that's a good question. Till you're dead or what? For the rest of your life. Where is this? Too soon. No term in the motion needed. No. No. Okay. Mm. Uh, it's been seconded. made to. I'll second it. <laughs> okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Entertainment ordinance. I'm sorry, I missed the last couple meetings. So this got moved up from the parking lot. Uh, we've had it on here. Um, it's 9.30. I don't know if you... It's, a, it's your meeting. So. Hey, we haven't had a long meeting. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's up to you guys. How long do you, I mean, this discussion whether or not the indoor needs to be, like, annual, or is it more about, this isn't the noise ordinance. No. 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 So, so it's about permits for It's more kind of how Zagmar is asking for indoor, they have to get a, or. The annual. Annual. Who gets, who has one right now or is supposed to be getting one in town? Is it mostly just the restaurants? Yeah, and you know, as I said before, uh, this started in the village. Um, the village had a police department that had to deal with this. Um, it hasn't really been an issue for a long time, except at the Zen Bar. Um, I don't know how many of the establishments in the village are having music at the moment. There's no outstanding permits. There's nobody that's requested a permit, and I haven't been around enough or going into these establishments and ever seeing anything or seeing advertisements. So I'm not, you know, calling up people or, you know, like I used to walk up the street and tell Mark, hey, you need a permit for this. And he would go out and pay $25. But so I guess I already have to recuse myself from the conversation, but I'm happy to be here as a, <laughs> as a, Should see. as a town member and discuss it. Yeah, I mean, I, I always question whether, you know, 
I think that there needs to be within zoning for a restaurant if they want to do entertainment. This is specific to indoor. Mm -hmm. That you know, just like an auto repair shop would get a permit for use or some industrial use, that there's some rule book on decibel level or something that holds them accountable for whatever their purposes want, gives the neighbors an opportunity to state their concerns, and then there's something that says this is the rule book you live in, and you don't have to worry every year that that, that for some reason your entertainment ordinance would go away. The auto repair place doesn't have to worry that we're gonna take away their ability to repair cars, right? But if they have a really loud piece of machinery, at some point the neighbors might say something and the town can get involved and you can go back to the zoning and say, well, what did they get approved for? And then, I don't, I think that that's more realistic, I don't think, I don't even know how we approach, you know, an auto repair place in terms of sound. Maybe it just says reasonable level sound levels. I don't know, but I do think that it's it's you know with any business, I don't see how that really makes sense for indoor specifically. Yeah. Um, sure. Knowing knowing from being on the DRB, you refused yourself. So anyway. Oh. Uh. <laughs> I thought you might have a question about. Uh, no, no, no. Music, so what I, my menu. point. I just want to make a point. So um, the problem I have is um, the indoor entertainment ordinance manages to become outdoor at times. In other words, through like doors opening. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that would be, so, I would mm -hmm. think, requirements so, of airlock doors and doors are closed. Depending on, I guess it's hours of operation, decibel level, yeah. right? I would think it's, it's well, how you would do it. Being a former <laughs> DRB member, it's usually in their initial permit that they have, like for instance, Zenbar had, it was specifically authorized for them to have indoor entertainment doors closed. And it changed, you know, COVID changed a lot of things. And I don't even know, Chris may be the best one to answer, you know, the impression I got is that Zenbar is now pretty much back to indoor entertainment, aren't they? That's what I just said. Indoor, yeah. So indoor with the exception of sometimes it's allowed to be outdoor. In other words, they don't always follow the rules the way they're supposed to, and my wife has to text them and say, right. hey, please quiet things down. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, that's upsetting to us because it makes us look like the SOBs, the band, yeah. and we're really not. We're just so how can we better follow up, right? So if there's like a zone, if it's in their zoning permitting, and there there are things that they're supposed to live up to, and if they're not, how do we better follow up and enforce it so that you're not having to well, that's be in that position, ask. right? Where, where's, where's the teeth in this issue in order to be able to? Right. Okay. I mean, uh, like let's let's take it in. So I'm the one representing a bar that has music. I am maybe had one time. You know, we try to be respectful of our neighboring community. We have a senior living right. right across the street, so we're very conscious of doors. We're very conscious of sound level. Um, if I got feedback from a neighbor showing concern, I would do a lot to try to make peace with them and try to make the modifications. And you know, some of that's not cheap, right? Like creating airlocks is very expensive, but. You know, it's, some of it's going to be a cost of doing business, and you got to figure it out, right? It doesn't have to look great, but you can. There are ways to do it, um, and then you know whether or not you know in scenarios like Zen Barn, where it would be screening of you know, there's ways to do it with probably trees and stuff. You know, it's like, but it's more. I think the question came up when I think the outdoor permit for Zen Barn mm -hmm. was being discussed that Noah asked about. The indoor, and I think that this got put in the parking lot surrounding that conversation, right? So, I do think it's fair to give businesses an opportunity to fix it. I, uh, of course, everything that we do, if we create a rule, has to have some kind of teeth or a governing body that follows up on whatever. You know, I think there's a lot that we, as a small town, don't really have the ability, a rule book that's almost impossible to police at times. So, I don't, I don't know what the answer to some of that is. I think. Um, I know with signage, I've had, I, when I bought Waterbury Wings, all of a sudden there was a letter in my mail that there was a sign that was out of compliance. And I was like, I don't really 
you know, like, I just bought this business. I didn't know that this was out of compliance. So I think that some of it is educational, and then you know, some of it probably falls onto zoning admins for whatever was written into the rule book surrounding the business use and the zoning application permit. So I just I think that. I have a feeling some of this probably stemmed from the parties of the village in the 80s of whatever those parks were. That, and <laughs> but it's not to say that we, you know, that that, you know, 20 years from now, who knows what this town looks like in terms of that. So if it's a protection that, I, I mean, I've never screamed about it over the years other than I'm like, oh, I forgot that I had applied for that. I mean, I don't think Noah's or those guys at Zenbarn are losing sleep over the idea that this continues to be an application, but I, I do think that maybe the board or should it consider removing this and putting it into zoning, but then it would require, I think, all the current users of entertainment ordinances apply for a zoning permit that I There are none, as far as I know, we don't, you know, uh, the Zen Barn, um, I don't believe they, I don't believe they were paid for. We've sent them applications. It's in their zoning permit already, or we don't? It doesn't matter whether it's in the zoning says you can do it, but there's an ordinance now that says you're supposed to have a permit. Right, so I asked the question because Mark made the comment about if we did away with the ordinance that folks would have to then apply for a zoning permit. So I asked the question to find out whether it was to know whether Zenbarn would have to apply for something different through zoning or if they already have that. I, I don't know. Right. They would have to apply for an amendment there because they probably have some sort of a zoning permit now. And it may not be what they need, okay. you know, based upon past history, it could have been wait, it's like where Zenbarn was. You know, like what happened last year was not within their zoning permit. Yeah, right. Yeah, but last year was an extraordinary time. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess the other question is, you know, there's, I don't know, does the Legion have an indoor? They, they had in the past. Yeah. Um, but are these a current? You know, I think yeah, some of this is the question of. From, I think it's bad practice to have rules that you don't enforce. Right. And, and they, and right now we have very little means to enforce it. I mean, I'm, I would be the enforcement mechanism, you know, and um, in the village, Mark is correct, things, things have changed a lot, you know, there's not Sisters, Sisters 2 or the pub. Waterbury Wings or the, the pub Thirsty anymore. Thirsty Turtle. Mm -hmm. Thirsty Turtle, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's exactly that, what happened was people were calling the trustees, and they were calling the police, and the police came to the trustees and said, we're getting a lot of complaints about this, we don't have anything that we can do anything with, so that's where the ordinances came into effect. And it was more, you know, so you could go in there and say, you gotta close the door, you know, there's an ordinance. Nobody, I don't think anybody ever got fined for, mm. you know, there's a list of fines for your first and second offense and the like, but I think what happened was the cops used to just go in and say, it's too loud. You yeah. to shut your windows and shut your doors. Here's the permit. And they said, oh yeah, and they did it. Um, and really, except, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have it, but we don't, there's not complaints coming to hear anymore from what's happening in the village. Yeah. Well, and this was a village policy that then turned into town policy. Right? Yeah, the, the, the village had it, and then I forgot what play, I think it was the, I think it was originally called the Roadhouse down on Route 2. They opened yeah. up and they didn't have, you know, that wasn't covered by the village, so the select board started getting some complaints. So we basically copied the village ordinance and the town ordinance says that if it's in the village, we don't even get to issue you a permit if the trustees, um, you know, are still around. They're not now, so it would, it would follow the roadhouse. They, the only ones they were disturbing was the dump chicks that might be sleeping in the trees at night there. <laughs> would this be a good conversation to have with Steve? I think it would. The, the problem has always been 
we don't enforce what what's on our right. books now. It used to drive me nuts being on the DRB. You know, all these things were all, you know, we had as things and they just, and I understand why they couldn't be enforced. Right. It was a very difficult, slippery slope. We didn't have the people, did we, did we probably didn't want to go to court on a lot of these things and it never did happen. But also, it all depends upon how much of the public is really being disturbed mm -hmm. by some of these actions. And I don't know, I think entertainment ordinances is not that bad. You know, again, probably people should be, you know, it's a couple of bucks extra to the community, you know. I don't, and at least we know what's going on. That's why I don't think it's just to do away with it maybe is not a smart thing. Are you saying if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Yeah. You know, Seems I would like, like to see. Broke, well, it is broke because no one's probably applying for it because no one, you know, there's no. We haven't done music in two years. Well, yeah, it, it is a weird right. time to talk We're gonna get that it. sign fixed. Yeah. I think most people haven't, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, to your point, I was gonna say the same thing. I think that there's coming more of a realization that the stuff the town doesn't have the stomach to litigate these yeah. issues. So, but. So, I to just do away with it, I don't know if that's a great thing either. I wonder though, as a bit like, as someone who might need to use this going forward when we're back doing it, like, wh how does it affect you? I guess I wonder, is there a fear that it's going to be denied to continue to ask For my business, it's it doesn't not really matter because so it's not my core right. business. And I've been in my business long enough to know that I think we can, we, Figured out. I'm right. a downtown. Like, there's right. a lot so of residential right there. Right. Um, you know, take an example like Zen Barn that we heard discuss around the outdoor. I think it it's, it gets a little bit more complicated. I think in a weird way, sound travels a little bit better in that scenario. Mm -hmm. And no I I do I do think it's important to make sure that like you know there's. There's some zoning uses. Say you end up with someone wants to do an event venue at a former barn or build a barn in something where there's, you can get through the DRB process and all of a sudden have an event venue. I mean, Snow deals with this all the time, but they have a hard cut off at 10 that like, mm -hmm. you know, you can't make noise at 10, you know, and, and there's certain places that know that rule and live and die by that rule oh, yeah. of, of 10 p.m. Yeah. Um, they have a police force that can you right. see all the outdoor right. concerts, they like, they shut but them down. The, and the issue with the Zen Barn, and this was complicated by COVID, but correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, there's, their zoning permit said they couldn't have outdoor entertainment. Right. It was, and, it was and, indoor and, entertainment with doors, right. doors and windows so, closed. And they were specifically prohibited from having outdoor entertainment. And because of COVID, this board agreed to allow them to do something, and in retrospect, this board allowed them to do something that another municipal entity had the right and authority to say they couldn't do. And that's where we really kind of, we hit a foul ball then right. uh, on that one. So, um, you know, the not every business, I, I think it's unrealistic to expect every business to come in and amend their zoning permit because right. once or twice a year they might want to have a band come in. I think right. having an entertainment ordinance allows them, hey, we want to do this, and you come in and you, you deal with it. The frustration that I have is that we just don't have a very good mechanism to enforce it. A, how do we know when these are, you know, if I see something advertised, I mean, I, I call them uh, Murphy. You know, because I saw advertised on Front Porch Forum that mm -hmm. they were going to be doing a, a thing up there at his at his event barn, and I said, "Geez, Tom, you need an entertainment permit." I saw it, so I reached out. I made him get it. He paid the fee, and that was that, and it wasn't an issue. So, if I know about it, I try to be um, even-handed about it, and make sure that everybody's doing it. But right now, there's not a lot of people doing it. And then if there's a problem, there's nobody around that, you know, this says you've got to stop entertainment a half an hour before 
closing time for the <coughs> serving alcohol. So you've got to stop entertainment at 1.30. It's not 10 o'clock, it's mm -hmm. 1.30. I don't, as Mark kind of said, I don't think it's any more the downtown that's the issue. I think people know that they probably have to stop around 10 o'clock. I think it's more like places like the Zen Barn, who they get some of these acts and people, you know, I know driving home, they're parked every, you know, that's where I was concerned about is the parking more than anything else. They get these events that they can't really handle and it, it's an issue, you know. You know, regardless, I know Chris is concerned about the noise. I'm concerned about some person getting killed on the, on, on that yeah. corner stretch when they have a, a big event. You know, that's where I think it's going to become a, more of an issue, especially, you know, if, if in the future we allow them, you know, if they have an entertainment, you know, permit, it, it maybe covers them a little bit more. So well, it doesn't sound like we have a solution for this tonight, no. is it? So should we, instead of belaboring it, should we try to move it to another time when we can, when it ain't so damn late, we can... Uh, I, I don't know what the... I don't think by putting it, it down, down the business road. owners yell yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> loud or foul, right? Um, I don't think we're going to do anything yeah. by moving it down the road. I'd say, let's either say yay or nay. Leave it as we just leave it as it yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. I'm just a member of the public right now. Yeah. Great. We'll make a motion Second. then. We leave it as it is for the time being. Second. Do not second. It's not a much. <laughs> do we have to do? Do we have to do anything? Do we have to vote? Can we just leave it? Yeah. Okay. Well, you had a motion and a second oh, unless okay. they want okay. a withdraw. <laughs> if you don't take any action, it stays in the place. Right. All right. So okay. Do you want to withdraw? Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. We should have quit while we were ahead. No, we're just trying to move it along. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we did that in an easy it's way. okay. It's one thing off the list for next time. Yeah. All right. I think we have to take back employee way. wages too, because we've talked about that. But anyway. Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. Go on. Um, all right. Moving on. Manager's item. Staffing update. A. So staffing update. Um, we're in the market for zoning administrator. Zoning administrator worked, uh, I think, a grand total of five days and quit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, five days. He, uh, he, well, Mike was concerned that he didn't have the experience to do the job. And he clearly was able to do the job, and he was, he was doing work. But um, I don't know what day it was, Tuesday last week, yeah, because Monday was the holiday. Uh, he came to talk to me and he said, I really apologize, but I've got another job offer that's mm -hmm. in my field. And he said that he's going to go to work for, um, what is it, Northern Reliant Power or something uh, yeah. that's down here in the battery uh, people. Yeah. So he, he told me, he said, I, they posted this job, I applied for it, they interviewed me, they got back to me and said that they we're not going to fill the position. And he said, so I continued to look. And he said, I took this job. And then on Saturday, so this was several weeks ago. It wasn't just like a little while ago. It was before he interviewed with the planning commission and everything else. So probably a couple months went by. And then they called and said, we decided that we need to fill the position. Are you interested? And since that's what he went to school for, and that's what his passion is, he said, sign <laughs> did, did, did we have much invested in him, other than some uh, time Steve probably put uh, training? Much invested in him. Uh, we, we paid him for five days, and, <laughs> okay. and, and he was on the payroll for one holiday that you know, <laughs> I, I couldn't figure out a way to, you know, yeah, so we paid him his holiday. Okay, so he was paid, but we didn't invest, like he wasn't in a training or something. Uh, we training. didn't pay for any training or anything. Okay. Because was he the kind of, I don't think, I, I think that was one of my, the meeting I missed, or the first meeting I missed was the one that you guys hired him in. Did we approach that? I know there was some discussion at one point to kind of hire in Steve's potential replacement because Steve has already announced to us that he's going to leave a year from March, is that? Yeah, I so, I mean, that. I just feel yeah. like we should 
review the budget for that position and try to actually hire Steve's replacement and maybe get ahead a little bit and give the opportunity of a long handoff to a well, pretty highly complicated position. Well, something that you position. want to talk with, you know, invite Steve yeah. and maybe Alyssa Johnson, the chairperson of the planning commission, to come in and, and talk. Um, that's that's a reasonable consideration, but the other thing is is that you know it's it's a tough it's tough to hire people right now, as you know. Sure. It's a it's a buyer's market or an employee's market, so to speak, and just trying to get people who are even interested. I mean, we advertised. We ended up, I think, with four really good candidates, and in the end, only this guy came to the interview. So. I'm surprised Alyssa hasn't gone for it. And, no. and between now and the end of the year is not a great time mm -hmm. to be looking. Well, anyway, um, if uh, you know, Steve is doing both jobs right now, and he has been since Dina left. And you know, getting somebody in there it would be helpful to him, of course. Should we advertise two different positions and see if either of them have mm -hmm. That's candidates? You're saying like a planning director and then a zoning administrator? Well, I'm not that sure what the other one would be. You know, there's one version that you're trying to hire a Steve, like and there's a another one that you're hiring what we already had hired, hired, and just see who's available and comes about and make a decision as a board if we should consider if the right candidate's there to, you know, you might spend a little bit more in fiscal year next year, but you might be in better position because what happens if we can't find anyone I'm when Steve goes? Well, I can talk to Steve about that and uh, put it back on the agenda. It doesn't necessarily cost us anything to just see how that strategy plays out right. and make a decision if we have a candidate that we feel like maybe we should consider. Is that the only staffing update? Yep. Okay. How, how's the new library director working out? She seems to be doing pretty well from what I can see. Good. But the, uh, the staff seems to like her mm -hmm. well, which is a big plus. Good. Um, Discuss scheduling <coughs> DEI training. Yeah, so um, I told the board a couple of weeks ago and you or I asked the board a couple of weeks ago and you said you'd like to have one more training. Um, and I was working with Mary to try to set something up and I finally got back in touch with her um, after last select board meeting and the only thing that was on the agenda for tonight that I knew of until like Thursday last week was just to see the fiber representatives and the cemetery commission. So I had made arrangements for her to come here tonight to do the training. Uh, and then when I talked to Carla and told her to put it on the agenda, she said, wow, we've got so. all this stuff. And the banner thing is coming back. So anyway, I called Mary um, and begged off for tonight and said we'll have to do it another time. So Chris, you're going to be away in November, right? Mm -hmm. So. The, December, I asked her about uh, November you'll be away. I'll be hoping to leave this weekend, but it's looking like it might get delayed a couple days. Yeah, but it's, it's but November. Right? So okay. okay. From October to, could be as long as the first week of December. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, she said that she's not afraid of winter driving <laughs> and stuff. She'd be willing to come in December. Um, that gets to be a, a busier time of year for a lot of reasons, you know, there's holidays, there's starting budgetary work. Um, is there any, any um, ability to do it on a different day than a select board meeting? We might need both select board meetings for real meeting stuff. 
um, is a, you know, a late afternoon, something that people can do. You know, it's, by December it's going to be getting dark at four o'clock. So. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I'm flexible for days. Flexible. Day. So there's flexibility then. Yep. Yeah, just let us know a day. And okay. Good. Thanks. All right. Anything else before we adjourn? Uh, is there any reason to have the, uh, one of the representatives or two of the representatives from the school board here to mm -hmm. kind of talk to us about what's going on and give us some kind of an idea? That's just a generic question there because I've got some concerns about obviously about the bond vote. Well, your next <coughs> meeting is going to be the day before the election. So, so that's why I asked. <laughs> they had some Q&As and things like hosting for communities for comments and questions. I don't know if there's another one. If I find another one, I'll send it to you. I think there's, I then, think there's one more. There's yeah, one. I'll check it out. and I can. Well, I can send it to everybody. I mean, I, I have to apologize for my disconnect from what's been going on there, but I, I hear, I understand it's a $60 million vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, w I went to a, I haven't been to a school board meeting for a while. I was shocked at the formality that they have at this. I was yeah. too. It's ultra formal. It's know, organized. The way that they record it, you know, each one votes separately. And well, they have because it's weighted. Yeah. It's a weighted yeah. voting system. I know. They only started yeah. doing that like a year. I know. It was just a little surprising. Oh, yeah. I Lisa Scalati said there's one more Q&A session next Wednesday. Has it come out? Do we have an understanding of 27 for community members? You know, a lot of times they say on um, a house worth 300,000, what the additional mm -hmm. cost for a tax change? Like, have they said, when I hear that, it doesn't mean much to me. I'm wondering, okay, on a $300,000 house, what's that cost for how long? I'm just like, I don't have a full understanding of that. Yeah. Well, well I, I heard, heard it was no for 30, a bond for 30 years. I heard. And what bothers me is not only will we be facing the amount of tax increase from that, but then there will be yearly tax increases on the budget itself. I would predict. This and I was thinking this about it. It's rolled into your property day, tax, right? Yes. And I was thinking about it the other day since I've been on the board. I think when I got here it was 30, our municipal. And I'm not complaining about our municipal tax. I'm just trying to look at it in perspective. but. I think it was 37 cents when I got here, and I, you know, we're at what, 56 now, are we? 56 or is it 51? Yeah, it's 51. Yeah, yeah I, I can try to get some of that information. Um, so, you know, I know, I, I know, I'm not denying $60 million. It's a big number, but it's it's six towns. It's been a long time, you know. I mean, the school that's there now was built in the '60s, and things need to be upgraded and <coughs> changed. So it's it's hard. How does the weighted system work? Because I'm assuming that's not sixty divided by six. It's Weighted no, no, no. We'll like it's it's going to be resident. You know, it's going to be size. per pupils. You know, it's a lot of it is going to be the number of pupils that come, but it's much more complicated than it used to be. I'm not sure how much state funding that there is. So. The other thing I was interested in knowing is uh, we got a new cameraman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you could re introduce yourself to us. Uh, you're sure. Uh, my name is Jerome Vitani. I've worked at Orca for about eight years. Uh huh. Now. Thanks. Well, I have filmed here before. Uh, I did I did that room back there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, welcome aboard, I guess. Uh, thank <laughs> thank was, this, uh, was this specifically for the issue tonight, or are you planning to be here for all the meetings? Uh, 
I, I don't make plans for myself. <laughs> we, we rotate, uh, you know, the distances that we travel, etc. Now a lot has a lot has changed because of the COVID for us as well. Right. Uh, and I edit at WhatsApp. I've been uh, beginning to edit uh, the hybrid meetings, mm. uh, like this one that we've had tonight. Um, Okay. Thanks, Ron, for hanging in there. <laughs> Later than normal. <laughs> yes, well. okay. Lisa, um, since you know, you said the meeting's on the 27th. What time? If you could put that in the chat. Hi, folks. I'm trying to get my thing here. Um, it's the school board meeting on the 27th, and they begin at 6 o'clock. You have the ability to. It's on that Google Doc link that I just included in there. Thanks, Lisa. Katie sharing yep. it with us. Yep. And so that lists the Q and A's that have already happened. They've all been recorded, and they're on the um, school board's, the school district's YouTube channel that you can watch. They start off with a presentation, and Tari Smith has like a little PowerPoint that she goes through that explains the the general. Um, pieces of the bond, and then there's questions and answers. They really have not had many um, people on the Q&A so far. So the first two were just the board members doing their own Zoom. And tonight we had one um, that was hosted by Mad River TV and the Valley Reporter, and I was on that. That's where I was earlier. Um, and there were a number of people. They probably, I think they had about a dozen people show up for that one. Um, your meeting had, had a bigger crowd, though. Um, and they uh, had a few questions from the public and questions from the uh, reporters and at last about 90 minutes, but um, they've, they've covered a lot of ground and covered a lot of the same territory on each of these um, sessions explaining the, the ins and outs of all the, the things that the bond will pay for. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you yep. very much. Thank you. Uh, anyone want to make a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Amen. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bill. Um, just a heads up.